That song is ingrained in so many people's brains because that's the only song in the universe. When did I agree to come on again? <laughs> I'm starting to wonder, everyone. Welcome to the Noobcast podcast for the 14th of July. Uh, this week's show, our guest is Riverboat Jack, coming back for another show. Um, so despite that intro, thank you for coming back to the show. <laughs> Yeah, no, no problem. Happy to be here. Uh, this time I'm actually doing video, so uh, you can see me. Hello. Yay! I it's, it's great because um, I, I appreciate anyone that has that. And then of course you got this lovely m microphone setup that's right here, which I really appreciate. I actually appreciate it. I like a good sounding <laughs> microphone. Well, you just rest your head against it. It's better than what I have to do to rest on mine because mine I have to put my head down like this and yeah. <laughs> Anyway, welcome back to the show. Um, yeah, I suppose we can just dive right into what we do. We talk about gaming news and other gaming-related topics. And with that, uh, Riverboat Jack, with you being back, we have to know. What have you been playing? What have you been doing? Okay, well, so I've been playing a bunch of stuff. I mean, obviously, since I was last on here, it's been like four months-ish. Yeah. Um, so I, I've, I've played a, I've played a few games between then and now um i played a, i didn't 100 percent complete it but i played heaven will be mine which uh if you haven't heard about it it is a fantastic indie game made by uh some cool queer creators and uh it's basically uh giant robots in space plus queer people plus kind of pretentious writing and if that's kind of your thing it's phenomenal um pretentious writing sounds good yeah i like this <laughs> <laughs> i also played pathologic 2 which is a game that i love because it's not afraid to let you know how much it absolutely despises you um and i've never felt so unwelcome in a game world and i love it um nice and then uh what's been taking up a large chunk of my time recently is finally sitting down to play through an entire MMO, which is not something I've ever done before and didn't think I was going to. Um, but Final Fantasy XIV was always the one that I had spent the most time in, and I finally was convinced by uh, certain individuals out there to buckle down and actually play through to try and get to level cap. And so far, I've made it through both vanilla uh, vanilla Final Fantasy fourteen and also um, Heaven's Ward, which is the first uh, expansion. So now I'm on to Stormblood, and then I have Shadowbringers, and then I will be, for the first time ever, ha in the position of having completed an MMO all the way, which is good, because I've actually lost out on jobs because I haven't played enough MMOs. So this really? Is... Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a thing? That a thing? I didn't yeah, either. I didn't... I made it to the final round of a couple interviews for some prominent outlets, and then they uh, went with people who had more MMO experience. So it's happened. <laughs> I mean, I guess if it were like, what, 10 years ago at the peak of, of wow, I could totally see that. But there's so many other things like MMOs have taken some, kind of a backseat to some of the other game genres. That, that's really surprising to hear. Mm -hmm. At least that's what it seems like. Um, Wow. Uh, but okay, so you got your vanilla and and um, wow, I, I'm not remembering the heavens. Final Fantasy fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Got through heavens word. Uh, heavens yes. word. Thank you. It was right down the tip of my tongue. I can see the image and everything. But so um, I mean, how are you enjoying it? How do how does it differ from like maybe other Final Fantasies and whatnot? And what are your what are your overall thoughts? Okay, so my overall thoughts so far are that the base game, like the vanilla version of Final Fantasy XIV, is quite a slog. <laughs> like, I didn't find myself caring about characters or story beats until about the 200 hour mark, which is quite a long ways to get through a game. Um, but once that started happening, I've been finding myself more and more engaged in the story, and I think it just took me that long to figure out the world and like the politics and like the wider context of the the system because it's 
at least in vanilla Final Fantasy fourteen, it's not presented in a way that is super accessible. Um, and if you are skipping through a lot of stuff, skipping through a lot of the minor cutscenes, you can miss a lot of what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. So it just took me a really long time to get engaged with all of that and figure out like who even like the main villains were or like what their goals were or like all of that stuff that's really important to understand in order to get into a story. Um, so yeah, it, it took me a long time. Uh, the combat system is very simple. I don't think that it really takes off until you get to dungeons where you can actually like really meaningfully pair up with friends and uh, tackle group content together. Uh, so, yeah. and that, that can kind of take a while. Yeah, no, I felt like that was what, when you started getting to like level 31 or 32, was that, or was it in the twenties? I don't, I played a little bit of vanilla 14. Um, I, cause I was able to get one of the trial accounts. Uh, and, and the funny thing about your, you're talking about doing this is last week, uh, we had our rotating host as a uh, hip anonymous who also was recently playing through final fantasy 14 and doing some of the uh, vanilla stuff. And he was talking about it as well. Uh, one of the things he pointed out, and I, I wouldn't mind hearing your perspective on this is that he's doing some of the stuff solo and he's doing it during our, uh, North America's overnight hours. So like two three in the morning he's like all right let's keep questing and all of a sudden he hits a dungeon and then it's like a wall <laughs> um and he's kind of put off by that but overall he's enjoying the game what, are you kind of having that same experience or how does that feel to you i mean the dungeons for me aren't terribly difficult uh what's harder for me is like actually if you want to do some of the more optional content in the game like right now mo there's like just a huge influx of people from Shadowbringers just coming out um so if you want to do like a normal dungeon that's part of like the main story it's really easy to get into one of those it takes maybe maybe five minutes but usually less than that in order to get into one mm -hmm. um that if if it's something you need to progress the story um if you're looking to do more optional content that's when it gets more difficult because um so there are a lot of optional uh bosses optional dungeons that you can do but those harder versions of those dungeons are a little bit harder to get into if you want to like finish them for the first time um, especially if you're doing it solo uh, there are a lot of mechanics that can be difficult to know about in advance unless you look them up or and even if you look them up it's hard to like if you don't have anyone kind of coaching you through it it can get really difficult Mm hmm no uh yeah i can i can totally see that I, I and you know the funny thing is it seems like that kind of overall with some uh mmo dungeons um elijah i'm not sure how much mmo experience you've got but uh, uh go ahead uh, the, it's more i got dragged by the ass through like a half a dozen of them by my best friend, his dad because his dad has the attention span of a flea and would gladly, you know, like, I got gifted, you know, like, six months of Pirates of the Caribbean online, and I experienced sort of the new world back when that was a new thing. Um, sometimes I enjoyed them. I, I suck at sticking with them. Like, I understand, I loved Wild Start a bits. I never got past the starting zone, though. Like, I put a fair number of hours in, but just, like, I never really got that far in, because, like, I, I suck at sticking with an MMO, it, because part of me is because I can't pause it. A lot of my stuff, I have to be able to pause it, or mm -hmm. it has to be short sessions because mm -hmm. of just how life is right now, and typically how life has been in general, and also just, I like things in shorter bursts, and a lot of MMOs, the gameplay tends to just not super click with me. I don't like hot bars. I don't like hot bars. Mm -hmm. I like real time. We're probably getting to that point. Like, Terra was the first major step, and there was, um, I'm blanking on the name, but there was this Source Engine based one that was like, what if Guild Wars but with monster hunter elements and physics. That one was actually a pretty badass brawler on Steam. I'm completely blanking on the name, but like, I played WoW for maybe 20 minutes. Uh, I got to the second planet in the Star Wars Tour beta, and at some point I'll finish playing the Agent storyline, because that was really cool, but that, that's about it. Um. Okay, so you've had some experience. I was about to say it, but I know, I was gonna say, I know Diz uh, over here has 
got a little bit of experience since we kicked this whole show off years ago as a mm or a, a wow podcast back yeah when... 20 minutes of wow i i feel like mish and i both kind of kind of wondered about that one yeah um I, I don't... <laughs> yeah no so t- so t- I, I guess going back into this and tying this back in with you uh there's a um kind of the experiences that riverboat was talking about uh i I'm trying to think how do how do do, do you see that as that same on um, first off did you play 14 did you play final fantasy 14 so i might have just resubbed a couple of weeks ago okay so you fell back into that black hole too <laughs> um got it uh so based on what uh, but based on what she was saying um uh, would you agree with what uh, a lot she's seen and compare that to other MMOs then or so uh, taking I mean, everything it, she's saying and compare that to others I think is kind of where I'm trying to go with this it's definitely the standard of MMOs and there are a lot of people who are suddenly like oh I'm going to play another class and then they're going through the main story and the convenient ways to get levels at this point it really is the vast majority of people being existing players. They, they're they not going to care about the extra content. And so you're kind of stuck trying to get a group together if you want to do something off of the, the beaten path. And th- that is the natural way of things with MMOs. It's one of the things that I think makes that genre a little bit less appealing to me because it is really fun sometimes to go and explore, you know? Um, I think of stuff like Sunken Temple, and there was a good period of time in World of Warcraft where nobody would have ever checked out that content. And it's awesome content. Um, but it would take you easily an hour, hour and a half to try to get enough people together to be interested in doing it. Because of a Sunken Temple. I mean, <laughs> let's be fair. But um, so, uh, so okay so one of the things that you just mentioned though is it was hard to get people gathered up to do that are you having that problem then in 14 i'm not but mostly because i'm not going out to try to get that extra content i know myself well enough to be like hey i'm just going to go to the raid content as soon as i can that's, and so that's, i know that that's where i'm going to enjoy myself so that's what you're doing and what about you doing uh, jack what are how's how's that experience been for you um I mean, it's been really interesting just because I've never progressed far enough in an MMO to actually experience what, like, a raid is like. Um, And I think Final Fantasy makes it pretty easy so far. I haven't encountered super tough raids with the exception of, like, some of that optional content I mentioned earlier. Uh, So I'm looking forward to getting to the end of Shadowbringers and seeing what, like, the current end game is as opposed to like the end game from like four years ago um but that being said like i can i can finally understand the appeal of mmos where like previously like i'm very much a story person and i care a lot about storytelling and being engaged in stories and like for the longest time mmos were just impenetrable to me because i did not give a shit about the story. Like, it's just, it's really hard for me to care. Like, I, I don't know what it is. It's something about the... Uh... It, it, it's almost sort of like, you know, when you're looking at, like, a, a high school production of something, or not not even high school, middle school. Like, I'm flashing back to watching Rurik die in Guild Wars 1, and it's like, every single time I'd be going, Yes! Yay! He was so annoying! Why was he our protagonist? <laughs> I'm so glad he's dead! The entire time leading up to that, in the text chat, alongside my best friend, I'm like, I'm gonna try to push Rurik off the cliff, and he's like, no, 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 no. And then, finally, he died! So yeah, it's just like, a lot of them have really not tried, or if they have, it's in a wiki page that you could just be reading about having to pay the subscription fee. And I think mm. that's something that Final Fantasy XIV really improves upon, especially as it goes forward like like i said i didn't really care about anything until like the main scenario quests that divide the vanilla game from heaven's ward where i was like oh there's like political intrigue and i actually like understand what's happening here and i know who these characters are and i kind of care about them and from that point onward um i noticed that they really upped their game and in terms of like 
presentation of like action scenes that are in like the cutscenes and stuff and like it's not just shot reverse shot of the in-game graphics engine or like a pre-rendered cutscene or anything like that um and mm -hmm. so it just it i i think that they have very clearly like gotten better in presenting their story as they've gotten along it's just that initial barrier to entry if if you're choosing to like you know play through from square one as opposed to like boosting your character up to whatever the starting level is for Shadowbringers. Um yeah. Hmm. Agreed. That's well really and it makes a lot of sense because of how Final Fantasy XIV came to be, right? When vanilla well when when a realm reborn came out, it was done at the last minute at great cost because they realized how much they had messed up their original launch. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of material I'm not going to say is slapdash, but it didn't have the sort of time to to develop the way that we see with the expansions. And everyone that I, I speak to who talks about Final Fantasy XIV um, is willing to give a lot of forgiveness to the vanilla experience mm -hmm. as a result of how absolutely horrible the launch was. And hey, at least they were able to assemble something of meaning out of that material and and launch the MMO further past that point. It's it's amazing, all things considered, that we've gotten to where we are now. Yeah, I mean, it's frankly like one of the biggest comeback stories in the history of video games, right? Like, they had a failure of an MMO on their hands that they had the option of either just letting die or trying to reboot it, and they just were like, yeah, whatever, we'll just build a game from scratch after we annihilate our old world with a giant meteor. <laughs> um... That's pretty cool. That's that's bold. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's funny. Um, with that that whole scenario, there's actually like a a six piece YouTube docu series on, uh, Final Fantasy fourteen and the Realm Reborn and what happened and all that. And it's really interesting. That you're right. Um, I suppose that's part of the reason that you see a lot more, um, polish to the content going into Heaven's Ward and the other uh, expansions. It's just it it wasn't rushed. Mm -hmm. um, Reborn had to be rushed and maybe that's part of the experience and why a couple of the gripes that we have with say uh, uh, trying to find groups for instances to continue your story or just uh, some of the leveling and whatnot can, can, can take what feels like a while to do I, I'd go so far as to say that A Realm Reborn is sort of like just you know a good outcome to like a Bioware situation like to you know like hold up because it's a very similar thing to what we saw with Anthem, where it was a lot of things did not come together. It's just that in the case of A Realm Reborn, it managed to stick the landing enough that people were willing to let go, and the fact that a lot of it was publicly on display, which in of itself is an interesting twist to the story, just to kind of shift things a bit. And there is one thing I want to additionally comment on, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, beyond even just the MMO experience, Looking for group functionality for online multiplayer has just improved so friggin' much. Oh, My yeah. gosh. I can find people who will use voice chat to play Star Wars Battlefront 2, the 2017 version, with me, and that is just stunning because I I remember being the only guy using a microphone aside from some kids in Mexico in Killzone 3, and never being able to find anyone to play with me on any multiplayer game I played on. So like we live in an age where you can find people so much more easily, and that's shifting the entire MMO and every multiplayer game's landscape to a degree that I don't think we are going to fully comprehend until a few more years once it's developed a bit further. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that, to its credit, Final Fantasy XIV does really well throughout, because they do have uh, their their daily uh, like dungeons and trials and stuff, and so people who want to get higher level gear they do the dailies which fill out parties for people who are just doing their main story quests or uh, some of those more optional dungeons um, uh, which is especially important because <laughs> they they ran into some problems with uh, how they built vanilla uh, Final Fantasy 14's main like their their culmination for their main story is like this massive uh series of dungeons with a bunch of bosses in it and uh they have to have unskippable cutscenes because otherwise uh they're, they're just so long 
um, that if you, <laughs> I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a mess. Like that part is kind of a mess, but to its credit, you're still able, if you're going through like vanilla Final Fantasy 14 to get people who are in Shadowbringers already, you know, 50 levels above you, you know, into your group. And so they know what they're doing and can kind of walk you through everything. And it's very helpful. Well, that's, that's fair. Maybe it's just me. I think one other thing that kind of helps with this particular MMO over others is, uh, the game's just pretty. Like it, it is a very nice looking game. Um, there are other MMOs where I've played it. And if I didn't have to go back to a certain level, I would never ever do it. <laughs> so I think that and contributes. I, I I, I think a lot of that comes down to like the environment and like the world design rather than any of its graphical capabilities. Because sure. If you kind of zoom in on anything, like the, the textures aren't great, and even on like max settings, and like it it definitely looks dated, but the designs are just so great that mm -hmm. it makes up for everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I yeah. I think you're exactly right. Design and style really never never age the same way. And I think that Final Fantasy has also found its niche advantage in that it does really bring the storyline front and center. Like World of Warcraft, you can get into the lore, you can learn that material, but it does feel like something that you're doing aside from the main experience, especially if you're rating things like that. You're like, oh, I see this character. We're going to knock that character out. I wonder who they are. And yeah. instead, instead, Final Fantasy, especially in the expansions, really lays out their character development and you see characters that you saw from vanilla suddenly change and develop and and escalate into something that's really magnificent like i don't know of a single mmo who, that's quite done that maybe guild wars 2 um but i don't know about character development as much as like oh we've come to grow and grow and love this one character well, You'll I think, have to speak more to that, Mish. I was going to say, I think part of the problem with that is that uh, Living World Season 1 kind of threw a monkey wrench into that particular situation with, with the Guild Wars 2 um, game because you had, um, <clears throat> um, what is it, Edge of Destiny, which was a, the characters that you got to know in, the, in vanilla Guild Wars 2. And then Living World Season 1 was all the content that occurred that was live and you had to be logged in at the time to do it. And while that was a ton of fun for those of us that did it, we never get to do that again. And season two, uh, during that season, we were introduced to new characters. And, and if you're playing Guild Wars 2 for the first time, you're just going, thrown from vanilla to season two. And it's like, oh, by the way, here's a bunch of new characters you, you should care about. And you don't know why. Like, uh, Kazmir and, and uh, Marjorie, I understand why their relationship is so important, why I like it so much, but other people don't care. And the fact that, that 14 does uh, a good job of making sure that you get into that that character mindset and whatnot is, is really nice uh other games other popular mmos uh, going back to to wow wow went a whole different wow, a route where blizzard actually m sold books in order to understand more of the lore you had to buy the book you wanted to understand why warlords of draenor happened and why there was suddenly an alternate timeline with all these um orcs again you had to read the trials uh, book, uh, what is it? War Crimes. You have to read that, otherwise you didn't know. And oh gosh, World of War Crimes is not a game I want to play. <laughs> World of War Crimes. <laughs> well, that's just it, right? Like, so the the boss, the final boss of uh, Mr. Pandaria, actually was captured and was on trial for war crimes for the for the terroristic acts that he committed against members of the Horde, the Alliance, etc. And in the book, it tells, talks about how he got away, and because of a, a dragon flight, he was able to be taken to an alternate timeline and all this other nonsense that they had to do to to go back and retrofit some of the story to to continue the WoW story. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. So, so the, the panda escaped his trial? Uh, oh, no, no. No, 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 no. It's not a panda. No, it was... Okay, he, it, no, that was Thrall... Uh, no, not Thrall. Um... Garrosh, Garrosh Hellscream actually like he was an orc. He was the leader of the horde, um, and he he was kind of a piece. But look, <laughs> that's that's neither here nor there. I think that what the the point of this whole thing is is 
where Blizzard went one route and it's like, yeah, you want to know more about the lore? Read the books. Um, Final Fantasy XIV, there are no books. You get all the lore in the game. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really appreciate that. Uh, me playing even Elite now, one of the things I said is I want to know more about the stories, but in order to do that, I've got to read the books. Um, so the fact that it's in-game is actually... I'm glad to hear that, and that's really appreciated. And if it didn't have a sub, it'd easily yank me in. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. So. Yeah. Ah, well, that was fun. That was uh, another barrier. Yeah, the sub. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they get away with it. They're one of the largest uh, MMOs on the market right now. So, you know, when you're one of the largest, you you get to have that option. Mm-hmm. Right? Cool. Uh, so besides 14 and that nice long conversation, has there been anything else you've played? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to hear what everyone else has been playing. Uh, that's fair. Let's go around and uh, ask... I'm afraid to do this, but Elijah, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Afraid to ask? What What are you expecting me to say? Are you expecting me to like throw out a laser shoot Larry game at this point or something? After dark, I, mean, I don't know. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be impossible. Pandora's box has been opened and every time we find something <laughs> yep. amazing. Yep. Too human, I don't Here know. Is, here's the twist, folks. Life has been in as polite a wording as I can put it, knuckin' futs. It has been knuckin' futs for a while. So I have not actually gotten to play that much. I have actually oh. gotten to play sprinklings of things, but I have not been able to finish a single friggin' thing since I was last on here. That is how insane it has been. I got to try um the gears of war 2007 port to pc and by the way epic games you wonder why people pirated your game so much and that was your excuse for never bringing the rest of the trilogy to pc yeah the reason wasn't because they didn't want to pay the reason was your installer takes over a half an hour on a modern computer to confirm that you haven't pirated the game before you've even done games for windows live Oh God! That is absurd. Ooh. Ooh. That is unacceptable. Yeah. You should feel ashamed of yourselves that you ever thought that was acceptable. It takes longer to confirm that it is a legitimate copy of the game than it does to install the files. Hey, you know what? There's only one person in the team who's able to verify it, and Steve has been working hard. <laughs> <laughs> he has been working very, very hard, okay? So give him his time. Let him do what he's got to do. Yeah, it's going to take half an hour. But for Steve, it's worth it. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, so that was an experience. To be fair, it actually was more playable because on PC I like, could like turn off the obnoxious motion blur so that I wasn't getting as seasick from sprinting. Which they seem to have fixed. I've tried Gears 4 via Game Pass, and it's a lot more pleasant. So it seems like that was genuinely just part of an issue to think. But just like going back to Gears 1, it's just like it's amazing how the game makes you feel angry. Like you're engaged, but you're not enjoying it, but you keep playing it. It's actually kind of unsettling. It's creepy how it does that. And just yeah, no, not 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 looking to touch that anymore. Um I briefly got to try Curse, the uh, Eye of Isis, which is an Xbox answer to, like, uh, Silent Hill that um, also has a bit of the mummy in it. It's okay. The PC port has really weird key binding issues. Like, you're required to use the arrow keys for movement. There's no way to rebind them. The most notable thing is that it was helped published and developed by the same people who brought us Siberia and oh. Siberia 2. Yeah, yeah, that oh. was a weird okay. thing. Um... I've played a bit of Battlefront 2, as I said, which has been a nice way to blow off Steam. It's finally to the point now where there's enough content that's actually worthwhile that I, I've been asked to do a re-review of it. So we oh. might be talking about that. Well, the thing is, they finally add enough modes that are like, hey, it's replayable, it's actually fun, and it focuses on the era most players actually care about, both the older ones and the newer ones. Because, like, Extraction and Capital Supremacy... If those had been, like, the only two modes besides Campaign and maybe Starfire Assault that they had launched with, I think people would have been happy. Like, seriously, if they had just focused all in on that, 
it would have worked so much better. They have, however, finally patched arcades so you can get the final friggin' mission done. It was unbeatable for the longest time because the AI would just wander like Roombas and you would run out of time trying to find them. So, um, you know, yeah. say it's actually worth picking up now if you've been holding off on it for like five dollars to ten dollars. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, realistically, especially on PC, because the thing is, the PC version has text chat and like. I know everyone's expecting the whole, whole Mordhau experience of tons of racists and bigots or whatever, but that's not actually the case. It's weirdly pleasant. It's it's weirdly not full of racists. I know, right? It's a multiplayer game where people are actually pleasant and, you know, make jokes and have fun and send each other friends. It's like how multiplayer gaming should be. So that's part of why I've just kind of enjoyed along with that. And, um... Well, I have learned, uh, there's one more that I have played, and there's one I have learned about that I want more people to know about, because it is something I'm very curious to try for myself. So, I'm assuming pretty much everyone here knows American McGee. You know, he made the Alice series and all that. What if I told you he made a Grand Theft Auto clone that's kind of like Jack 2, but also that robots movie with Robin Williams? With the sense of humor of Terry Pratchett. And it was an Xbox and PC exclusive in 2004. And it even almost got nominated as a Game of the Year pick by one magazine, but it got beaten out by uh, uh, Chronicles of Riddick, The Escape from Butcher Bay. This game is American McGee's Scrapland. This actually exists. I, I, I had to look it up because when I first saw someone showing off gameplay, it's like, this can't be real. All anybody ever talks about when they talk about American McGee besides Alice is Bad Day LA and how terrible it was. But no, he apparently actually made a fairly decent racing, running around thing. It's even got an unconventional story where the it's about a society of robots who for the longest time have immortality, but suddenly some interloper has started causing deaths to be permanent. It's a really neat concept. It's really distinct, and it's as if we all culturally blinked and forgot it happened. Because, like, it got mm -hmm. decent reviews. I think the problem is it was 2004, and things like Half-Life 2 and Doom 3 and Fear and all that just overshadowed it to the point that it just never got recognition because... It doesn't seem to be a bad thing. I looked up gameplay. It looks fine enough. It, 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 graphically, it looks oh. ambitious for an Xbox title. Yeah, and it was made by the same developers that made Castlevania Lords of Shadow and Metroid Samus Returns. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's like okay. it has high pedigree behind it. It, it. it shouldn't be this minor footnote, so <laughs> yeah. What? Hold on, hold on, hold on. What was its release, though? Because I might have an answer to this. It was 2004. Right. Are we talking early 2004 or late 2004? Oh, late. Uh-huh. November 4th. Let me tell you what happened then and why it's a footnote. Half-Life 2, Halo 2. Both came out right around the same time. No one gave a oh, shit yeah. because those two games came out within a week of one another. And that's all anyone was playing. In fact, at that point, uh, it, was, it was November 2004. Uh, what is it? November 9th, I think, held a record for the most, um, most people calling in sick on any given day because that many people had called in to play Halo 2. See, I was smart and I requested like three days off from work myself, but, but a lot of people didn't. They called in. That is why it's a footnote. Like, it, you're right. You're talking about a great pedigree and whatnot, and, and it, sounds like any other circumstance it would have been probably done pretty well for itself but the fact that oh, it went up against that mm -mm. the thing is it extra hurts because they did try again they actually delayed the european release until march of 2005 to try to give themselves more room but it seems by that point just nobody cared apparently mm -hmm. it also has multiplayer support i'm not sure how that works but apparently so all of that going on at once, so that's what I'm really curious to talk about, but the only other one that I can really say to having played any substantive amount of is Resident Evil Revelations 2, because Resident Evil Revelations 2 is like one of the best Resident Evils, and if you haven't played it, then shame on you. 
I am just, you know, I finally got back to playing it because um, I finished on 360 years ago, and I was like, okay, you know what, I want to revisit it. And then I ended up with the PC copy that I kept not getting around to. And then there was a sale on PSN for the PS Fred port. What is PS Fred? It's the PS Vita. Some the... people don't recognize <clears throat> it, so it is now the PS okay. Fred. The, the PlayStation so, so... Vita, got it. Okay. <laughs> but um I, I, I think say, that literally for... broke the stream. <laughs> I, I, I want to be real quick here in saying that um having played the handheld port, yeah, I'm seeing why this never came to 3DS because um it has a really unique problem. Like it's not terrible. It has gyroscope support for aiming and all that, but um your frame rate dips with every hit you take. The actual on-screen blood textures cause the frame rate to drop on the handheld. So you're basically required to play this on the lowest possible difficulty so that you have a shot at finishing it. So it wasn't like, optimized is what you're saying. Not really. I mean, it's impressive. Otherwise, it runs great. It's just specifically when the damage texture shows up on screen, it's the one moment where it just all goes to kaput. Yeah. So. And it, it really sucks. But um, the PC port's been marvelous. It's been very good times. I'm to episode two at this point, and just it remains arguably one of the more interesting games to explore trauma as a theme without being overt about it and also just I i'm gonna say it there's some writing in it that's not bad there's a lot of melodrama but there's some moments that are genuinely well written stuff there's some actual characterization that makes you care about these people and goodness me moira has absolutely no idea how to swear to save her life i just like i want to take her aside and be like no 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 hun no one says what in the moist fuck. No one says that. Just, just, no. I'm adding that to my vocabulary now. <laughs> just to prove you wrong. Take that. Just, oh, no. <laughs> it's, but, um, it just, it's really good stuff. And they got this brilliant guy to voice over Barry Burton, who just sounds so serious all of the time. It's like, I know this is a comparison that not everyone's going to get, but if you've ever heard Adventures in Odyssey, it's like if Mr. Whitaker was younger, way more grizzled, and had been taking acting lessons from David Hayter. It's amazing. Okay. But yeah, it's usually on sale for really cheap. It's awesome. And the final thing I'll say is it has a bonus game inside it called Raid Mode that's Horror Destiny. It is amazing. You should play it. Even for just that, you should play it. Are you saying the moon is haunted? Oh, there are more than <laughs> the moon is haunted. I can okay. tell you, though, those B.O.W.s came from the moon. <laughs> yikes. Uh, yikes. Anyway, moving on. Awesome. Well, uh, with that said, welcome to the show. And kicking it over to Mr. Dizzy. Dizzy, welcome to the show. How are you doing? What have you been playing? Um, if you haven't heard it already, I my sinuses are full of things, and I'm very glad that I cannot give you those things right now because we are not actually in the same room. I am sick. And well, the good news is that means that you get to spend a lot of time hanging out, not really being able to be super active. Which means lots of games. Yes. So, yes, I imagine so. At first, when I started getting really sick, I decided that Final Fantasy XIV was a really good choice. And I spent a decent amount of time there. Um, one of the people that I know who brought me in said, hey, you should do this thing called Palace of the Dead. And it's a very specific dungeon. And I'm, I'm going to go into this for a little bit because it, it's this interesting little meta scenario. So Palace of the Dead is a dungeon that you hit early on in the vanilla period. Its design apparently is to level you up as efficiently as possible. Oh my gosh, that's awful. <laughs> um, so 
it levels you up really quickly, and while you are in it, it's essentially like a little metagame. You start at level one in your class, and you fight against opponents that have no health, and it's pretty much run through um, this randomized dungeon that's created for you. Okay, people like randomized dungeons. This is really cool. Got it. And coming in as somebody who's never actually made a max level character, like I played years ago, like before Heaven's Word came out. And I got a character to level 30. Oh, that please. We, we talked about all the WoW that we've played. It's okay. <laughs> it's true. But I've never gotten to the end of where people should stop playing Palace of the Dead and actually start experiencing the game. So I'm going to come out of this with all of these different abilities, ready to get my class change done, and I'm going to have no idea how anything works. And this is the optimized way of playing the game now. Which reminds me, especially with that old content, that one, this is why people disappear and don't do some of the, the side content, because they don't have to, because they don't have to get that experience. But two, I'm playing a game that isn't even the game, and it's the best way to play the game. What? Yeah, I actually haven't that... experienced the Palace of the Dead yet, so I'm excited to actually play it. I think I I think I unlocked it. I just don't know how to get there again. <laughs> it is cool. It is it is actually a really cool experience to go into. I don't want it to be my only vanilla experience, so I'm probably going to jump off and and do some main story quests and and hang around a couple of areas just so that I can get a feel for that. But <laughs> That being said, that's that's where all of the action is. And I will say this. I think it is very smart for an MMO to have an option that is new for people who are leveling alt classes, or it's new content, but it's designed for you at a lower level. Mm -hmm. I think that way you can still get participation and some interest in there. And there is apparently a storyline to it, which I don't know because all I've seen so far are these uh, slow um, reveals of some some weird ghost lady, presumably. I don't know. And we get, like, a segment of it for every dungeon that we go through. So it's like, okay, give me the full reveal. I'm ready for it now. Uh, but, uh, uh. But, but that's been all of my Final Fantasy experience. And um, unsurprisingly, that hasn't kept my attention for a lot of time because it is very, very grindy. So... Dragon Quest Builders 2 recently came out, um, just on Friday, in fact. And that's been all of my sick time, pretty much, has been going through and exploring that. Now, I have spoken at length about the original Dragon Quest Builders. Absolutely love it. It's a fantastic design. And Dragon Quest Builders 2 pretty much handles all of the big concerns that I had. There were a lot of inconveniences, a lot of time that was spent doing little things that could be automated. And the game does a brilliant job of having the people who come into your village and you get to meet these different people and they all have their different stories. It's it's good. It's charming. It's it's just like small world charming awesome. But those characters, after you've gone through their plot line and things, will start doing stuff for you. So you start building yourself a farm and they'll they'll sow the seeds for you. And they'll make sure that the plants get watered and take care of things. Um, you can even have them eventually like make buildings for you. If you have a, a decided blueprint for them and you have the materials, they'll just go ahead and make it. And I love that sense of taking the inconvenient things about building games and giving them an easy way out. Now, if you want to do all of those things, if you want to make it yourself, you can. And that's that's definitely a segment of people who play Minecraft likes, but it's definitely not me. And so they've opened up the doors in a lot of good ways. The storyline's fantastic. They definitely, they definitely put enough story in it to be interesting, but give you enough flexibility to do whatever you want, which is the ultimate, I think, in a sandbox. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, th I feel like there's been a few people I know that have been playing the game, and it, I mean... Uh, if, if it seems like it gives you kind of a best of both worlds where there's actually a plot to what you're doing along with the building and um, that's a 
nice change. I don't know. So how much time have you actually truly s sank into uh, Dragon Builders 2? Um, in the last couple of days, it's probably been about 12 hours. Okay. I can't do much else right now. I don't want to go out. It's it's <laughs> and Final Fantasy XIV as as straightforward as it can be, especially doing Palace of the Dead because everything's at a moment's notice and you have traps that can instantly destroy you. My mind is not ready for that right now. It's still a little too cloudy. So having something that's a little bit easier, a little bit less punishing, yeah, it feels good. That, no, I guess that makes sense. Okay. And that game, like. I played the first one quite a bit. It's like nothing but good vibes. Like all the way through. 100%. No. Oh, okay. Cool. Um so let the yetis live. <laughs> those those yetis. Oh my gosh. They're cute. They are adorable until they try to kill you. They're just licking you. It's not their fault that their tongues are very rough. Out of context, that is horrible. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Phrasing, boom. <laughs> Words. Uh, so I don't know where else to go with that other than to say it's dangerous. <laughs> yes. Are you uh, talking like uh, Top Gun Dangerous or Normal Dangerous? Like Darkwing Duck, let's get dangerous. Yes, okay. I, my <laughs> mind went to the exact same place, so I'm so glad that you said that. <laughs> I was thinking the exact same thing. Ah, oh, criminy. Okay, anything else you've been playing, Dizzo? Is that, uh, that. Out of all of the things that this adult mind can recall, those are the two big pieces. Okay. There, there have been little bits here and there. Um, still enjoying Division Two, but ah, oh, that's right, you were playing that too. I think that's going to definitely take a, a spot to the side, especially, especially with Final Fantasy XIV. I want to at least get a character max level before I really spend a lot of time in a different game other than Dragon Quest Builders because it's awesome. Yeah, no. You're saying Division 2 might not factor into the equation for a while. Yeah, I'm not ready to add it in. <sighs> at least these you had a decent are multiplying. At, at least you had a you had a pretty decent response to that with your uh with your pun back there. It is a nice nice work. It's interesting you say that I completely forgot you're doing Division 2, but you've streamed it and everything. So, um you know, it's interesting. I feel like the division kind of got that treatment, right? Like, there's definitely a dedicated base to of it that are playing the game, and that's great for the people that enjoy it. But for anyone else, it's like, yeah, this this is fun. All of a sudden, we've uh, it's like, oh, look at this new shiny, and we've we've become distracted uh, from it and not playing it as much. Are you kind of having the same experience? Kind of. I think it's it's the sort of game that's better the longer you can burn it. Like, the, the more time that you can spend in the game and just, like, I'm going to spend half an hour here and then check it out a week later, I'll spend half an hour there. I think that that's the ideal scenario of playing it. I feel like if I don't do it that way, I'll end up ripping through all of the content within a week. That Especially, you think especially so? the way the thing's been. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Right on. Uh, well... I suppose, unless there's anything else you want to add to the list of things that you've been playing. No, no, I think that pretty much exhausts it. What have okay. you been up to, Mish? Oh, lordy. All right. Um, so I've been playing a little bit of Diablo in Season 17. I actually have been working on some of the chapters, so yay, I might actually have some stuff from the season, because I kind of forgot that was a thing that you, you did with Seasons. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I've been doing a little bit of that. Um, I think that was on stream before. For the last episode so nothing new beyond that um the the biggest time sink is a uh, the grand theft auto roleplay holy cow um i've i've put quite a few hours into that i would say so so uh i know that you're a cop yes and i and i know you're new to the beat but 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 are you the sort of cop that's above the law? Are you 
Are you a renegade? <laughs> Only when it comes to traffic lights. Um, <laughs> those, the timing of the traffic lights in, in Grand Theft Auto V, the mechanics of it all, sucks. So yes. Oh yes, thank you. I remember trying to play a legitimately player. It's like they can suck. actually fail missions by trying to obey traffic law. Yeah, don't. If you're playing the actual game, it, it not, not, the role play is different. But if you're trying to obey traffic laws in the actual game, screw it. Don't do it. You'll regret it. Um, but for yeah, no. Uh, when it comes to traffic lights, yes. Everything else, no. Um, in fact, uh, Officer Gene Hart is one of the more friendly ones, um, and have had, even had citizens of the city say so. It's like, oh no, her. She's one of the friendly ones, and da da da. I'm like, all right, well that's that's a good sign. That right? That people like like Jean. I don't know. You're engaging in community policing. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, it worked out really well. So. <laughs> Two weeks ago on the podcast, we were talking about it and the fact that I might join the force. And it's like, how would I end up having the story where this would pan out with with Gene? And that night, I logged in to do some RP, and uh, I had a, uh, it was a technical glitch, really. But um, I was on a rooftop. I was kind of looking down on the city, looking at the lights and everything. And and Gene was contemplating, and all of a sudden, like everything kind of blacked out. And when she came to or came back, um, and I could see everything again, she was in a coma on the road. So it means she had run out of health and was on the road and had to call EMTs. So EMTs showed up, cops showed up, and it's like, oh, this is perfect. Now she's inspired. She's been, she's inspired because she's been helped and she wants to return the favor. And that played perfect into the story. Um, Cause I wasn't sure how I was gonna do that two weeks ago, but yeah, been on the beat for, for a couple weeks. Um, I infamously helped um, W Greats, um, uh, Officer Greats on the server, uh, take a door off his cruiser that happened I, I was helping him install AC that's what I was saying there mm. um, he, he told me to get out of the car to impound something I got out of the car and he backed up next to the barrier and tore the door off but apparently it was my fault <sighs> uh, so yeah I've been playing a lot of that I've been a lot of stuff There's, I gotta tell you I gotta tell you and, and this is actually something I might ask the rest of you too is I didn't think that I would really enjoy it the way that I've enjoyed it, right? Like I've I've been aware of the RP thing for like a good year now, right? And I finally started seeing some people that I knew doing the RP too. I'm like, eh, eh, kind, of, kind of, I was kind of interested. Uh, Grace was the one that was like, no, come on, join the server, blah blah blah. I'm like, fine, I'll 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 get on, and I did, and I did. I I've had probably a dozen 15 hours logged in and I was really enjoying it to the point where I I got myself enlisted with the police department and in game and role playing that out and really enjoying some of the stories that people bring to the server because remember uh, or in case you don't know uh, when it comes to Grand Theft Auto roleplay you're not actually playing Grand Theft Auto you are playing a roleplay in the city of uh, Los Santos in the Grand Theft Auto like mechanical universe, that's about it. But every all the other stories, they're your character stories, and that's. Um, and I I really got sucked in and really had a lot of fun with it. So, I have to ask the rest of you now, um, being having been sucked into a game that I didn't previously think I would get sucked into, what's a game that you all tried out, got sucked into, and had a lot more fun and enjoyed it when you didn't think that you would. To think about that one i'll give it a second i'll give everyone a second to think about that while i talk about that a bit more but yeah that's the question i posed because i didn't think i would and then that did and i put a ton of hours into the game and had a lot of fun with it and it, i will definitely be doing a lot more with it and i met so many incredible people too that's the other part is meeting other people especially the server i'm on a lot of those other people are other streamers i've met other streamers that i would not have met otherwise and a lot of fantastic personalities and people which I really, really enjoyed. Okay. All right. I think I've got mine. It looks like Elijah two of you. Ready to go. Yep. So, Elijah, what's what is that game that you tried and enjoyed that you didn't think you would? 
I actually have two picks. There's, there's actually several over the years that have surprised me, but two that stick out to me most. Uh, there's one that is going to astound everyone simply because of how much I've praised it since, and another one that's coming up soon, actually. for the. Um, I did not think I was going to like Dead Space. Like, seriously, I played the demo for Dead Space 2, and I was completely underwhelmed. It wasn't until a former friend gave me his PC copy and just was like, dude, just try it. And then I played it for a couple hours, and it was like, okay, actually, this isn't that scary, and there is some depth to come. I nearly skipped the second one, though, because of the damn turret sequence, which is just awful in the first one. My gosh, that was poorly done. But, um, it was just, it was my gateway drug to horror games. After that, I did Fear, and it just it inspired all of that. So, that was probably the best thing that former friend did. So, uh, I'm thankful for that. Okay. And, um, the other more recent one, and, um, I, I, I really just, you know, I don't want to go into too many details, because like I said, I've got an actual video for this coming up later this month. Um, Amazing Spider-Man 2. The game. I'm serious. A licensed it, game. Uh, not just a licensed game. A licensed game based on one of the worst Sony movies ever made. One of the worst superhero movies ever made. Made by a developer who was going to lose the license that next year. Who were overworked. It was Activision published. And... The previous one wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. Like, it was great at spectacle. The Amazing Spider-Man 1 is amazing at the sheer scale of everything. But Amazing Spider-Man 2 is like... Editing the video for it made me want to go back and play it again. It was remarkably better and smarter than it had any right to be. And we've lost Jack. Oh, dear. But, um... Yeah, just... I am kind of astounded at how enjoyable Amazing Spider-Man 2 is. It does a lot of things right. It deepens a lot of mechanics. It even manages to make Stanley not be a gratuitous cameo, but actually be a character in the story. And he gets a very touching moment where he really gets to dig into what he wants for Peter Parker and Spider-Man going forward in the hands of others. It's this extremely meta moment that's just so sweet and... It's a Spider-Man story that's willing to also get dark at times and explore the idea of mourning and, you know, how you process grief and stuff like that when you know that there was someone who perpetrated the loss that you suffered and everything. Like, and the amazing thing is they didn't have to follow the script of the movie. They incorporate the villains from it, but they got to make it a completely original story. And it just... it The most astounding thing is it actually almost works as a prequel to the new PS4 one. Because literally, this one ends right around the point where the next one would kick off. So, or, well, just with the time skip between. So, in a weird way, it very poetically all clicks together. And I'm sorry that Beanox didn't get more time, because I think if they'd had, like, another year of development, it could have been another Arkham City-level quality experience, if they'd had that extra year. Okay. No, that's interesting. Um, I'm guessing that when you say one of the worst Sony, I suppose it's one, you said one of the Sony movies, but when the comic book movies you haven't seen the the first Incredible Hulk, so um, because that was bad <laughs> but that's an interesting choice and it's, it's fascinating to hear that um, so The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was was that in, in Dead Space and I know I know for a fact that Dead Space is definitely one of those games for you because I've replayed Dead Space yeah. two over two hundred hours. Yeah, yeah. So that it's surprising to hear that's one that you didn't think you would enjoy, and, but yeah, I definitely know you enjoy it. So okay, Both yeah. We're just really happy accidents. I think that's what they kind of all are, aren't they? Like when you when you play it, and like yeah, I'll, fine, I'll give it a try, and then, yeah, it's a happy accident. Uh, Dizza, what about yourself? What what is this, a game that you didn't think you would like? And then you found out you actually really did. Well, so I remember I got this game. One of my friends sent it to me on Steam. And you know how it is with gifts with Steam. It's like somebody got a four pack. Okay, you're getting the fourth one, whatever. Um, and I tried it out and I was pleasantly surprised. And I mean, 
I guess, Mish, I just have to say thank you for Bad Rats because that was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. I was, I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that. Okay. But I will say, um, just going through my Steam list quick, uh, Sanctum was a surprise game for me in that regard. Um, I was brought to playing Sanctum. I was not, I did not do so willingly. <laughs> and then I ended up being to the point where I'm like, oh, hey, this is the game that I want to play multiplayer with you. Let's play Sanctum together. And then he's like, oh, I'm not really feeling that no really we need to do it and i think there's something about the core game loop of well pretty much any tower defense game can can hit those those nodes in a very interesting way where it's like hey i want to optimize how can i put this tower in the best way possible and then there's the fps element on top of it and it isn't heavy duty i'm not a big fpser to begin with so that's like the perfect amount of shooting for me I'm just, I'm finding this interesting because it's feeding me flashbacks to when I convinced you to play Fear 3. It's like, it has to be cooperative and it has to be very different, but every now and then a shooter just kind of creeps in and sneaks under the radar for you. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, Fear 3 was fun, and I definitely enjoyed it. would enjoy playing it with people again. But Sanctum oh, yeah. got me to that point where I was just like, I am proactively getting people involved. Hey, we should do this. You know, it's funny that you say that about shooters because I do seem to recall that you enjoyed uh, Planet Side 2 quite a bit as well. I did enjoy Planet Side 2. I think I enjoyed it more for the people I was hanging out with than I did for the game. Okay. No, that's fair. Okay. Oh, that makes total sense. Yeah. And um... first, first couple of weeks, though, I will say... Um, I, I have not had so much fun dying constantly. Mm, mm-hmm. The grind is real. But uh, it, it's interesting you bring up Sanctum, because um, at some point I need to see if I still have the files on hand. I don't know if you know this, they actually released their their like prototype for free before they went commercial, so you can actually see the very beginnings of Sanctum from way, way back. It's kind of surreal to know that they went from that point to making it be this franchise and then making lots of good simulator games. It's a very weird arc for coffee stains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Okay. Sanctum. Good. Interesting choice. Uh, what about you, Jack? What's, uh, what's a game uh, that... I have to go with Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, um, sure. Okay. For, for me, that was always, like, the line in the sand that I would never cross. And like, because only real nerds play Dungeons and Dragons. Like, my interests are totally not really nerdy. I'm, I'm like a cool nerd, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, I fell in with a group of people who really liked playing Dungeons and Dragons, and so I got invited to a game, and I was like, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. You know, whatever. It's just one time, right? And then... <laughs> sucker <laughs> so that's, how, that's how they get you um so just I... just just play this character for me i've even made the sheet for you you just <laughs> just run with it well so i i didn't initially get invited to play dungeons and dragons it was a game of exalted which if oh uh, which mm. oh my, oh my goodness i have only ever played i've, I've played through a couple like one or two sessions of Exalted, but my like long term dream is to play a long Exalted campaign because that game is bananas. Um, it's basically like combining Dungeons and Dragons with like I don't know Dragon Ball Z. Um, yeah, it's like superheroes almost. Yeah, pretty much, but set in like a crazy fantastical world where like. There are undead dreaming gods, and like you live on an old god, and it's it's crazy, and I I love it so much. I I literally spent <laughs> I literally spent like probably twenty hours just figuring out the like basic lore of the world at one point. It was a really fun time. Uh, but then I fell down the Dungeons and Dragons rabbit hole, which is much easier to understand, I think. 
Um, and uh, now I do two, now I have two live play podcasts where I play Dungeons and Dragons. So I think that qualifies me as uh, wow. fallen all the way down. The you, rabbit hole. Yeah, you've, of course, I want to point out out of the four, four hosts this week, um, two of us were sucked into role plays as the the thing that we didn't think we would like and we really did so i wonder if that is an interesting factor into that people do enjoy role plays when they don't actually realize they're going to enjoy role plays and it's funny that that's the case too because in myself i've i've been playing a single campaign with a group of people since 2013 and their campaign has been going have been going on for years prior to that <clears throat> um yeah actually um, I have a story to tell that regard that relates to finding out about role play as well. Um, you're completely muted. I know. That's fine. I just no, no, no. Keep talk? going. Keep going. You're fine. Okay. Um, so back in the day, old school Battlefront two. Um, there was a server browser because you know that used to be a thing, and it was nice in mm -hmm. multiplayer games. There were custom servers, and um, just one day, um. To put it bluntly, the multiplayer in Battlefront 2 was kind of lawless to the point that a few of us actually... You're mentioning being cops for roleplay. We had to police for real on one of the free-for-all servers because people would just break every rule that was established. So there were the FET police. You played as Django or Boba and you killed anybody who wasn't playing by the rules. It was a thing. But um, the roleplaying community kind of just spontaneously happened from two groups and I just waltzed into one. Unfortunately, bless his heart, the guy who was essentially game mastering um, the one that was very serious, me and another guy waltzed in and were, you know, making all sorts of really comedic things and he had to roll with that. He's, you know, he's having a Zane Izzard be very serious and then here are her two cousins who are like, I think I just found an ancient McDonald's on Hoth. So <laughs> that was a thing, but um... The amazing thing was the the game Star Wars games in particular. Like you're describing how GTA allows for some really good role playing. There's actually a community a lot like that in Jedi Academy now, and the guys that I was role playing with in Battlefront eventually moved to Jedi Academy later. Like you can have like five gigabytes worth of just mods for custom skins and maps and everything. And these people have developed, developed you know, intricate lightsaber mods that make it so that the duels are movie accurate and everything, all sorts of additional powers. It is to a degree that it actually even scares me, and as has already been previously referenced, I can say a few things in Mandoa. It's just it's like, <laughs> this is some stunning level of role-playing detail that just has transcended the original mechanics. I, I mean, I've had friends take characters that I role-played in text and make them be properly modeled and textured, and I can walk around with them in a game world. And that is just... You don't really get that experience very often. And if no. I'm being entirely honest, role-playing is the only reason that I own Jedi Academy. And one of the few reasons that I kept Battlefront 2 installed as long as I did, because the games themselves, they're okay, but... The actual sense of community, getting to know other people, having lasting friendships, some of which still exist to this day, is just, it's something that transcends any sort of design and just elevates the experience no matter what it is. Hmm. It, you know, it's funny that you're talking about the having a character that was texturized and added to a game and whatnot, and now, uh, at least for myself, that's part of what it is, and that there's, there's another element to it, but... Um, Gosh, with with role play in general, just uh, especially when you get attached to characters, I suppose that's part of the reason that it's really easy to get attached to an RP and and get sucked into it. Is because you're it, if you have a character that you really like playing as, you can you you just you get attached to the character of it all, right? Like I, for me, I like Jean Hart, you know. Um, I I really like the character and whatnot. I mean, granted, she's slightly based off me as a person, but. Uh, I'm. I, that's okay part of the reason like I'm enjoying yourself. it, huh? It's okay to like yourself. I. Yeah. I mean, I guess. I mean, I guess that's true. Um, most role playing is like you're basing it a little bit off of yourself. I would be lying mm -hmm. if I said that any of the characters that I've created over the years, I didn't inject some part of me into it. It just. It's like, 
it's improv theater on a scale and budget that you'll never have. So why not have fun with it and just, you know, do your own little spin? Even if you're mm -hmm. working with an established character from a canon timeline or whatever, you can still have fun with it and you're sure. giving it your own thing. Well, sure, because at that point you're talking about like a, an acting performance of a character that uh, a character's had several actors. Like, um, look at a Bond or look at a... I, I suppose there's a few other options out there. Uh, uh, if we talk sci-fi like uh shatner or or uh, not a, a shatner um uh captain kirk sorry they had shatner and uh pike that played them right it's that different presentation and that slight perf that slight change to it that it's still the same character but it's just a slightly different twist on on that character and that's an interesting point too because um if it's a decent character anyone else should be able to take the core character and work with it and make it still make it the character um otherwise and it's i guess when you're role play there's nothing wrong with just projecting yourself um the, the whole reason i got into the gtrp the uh officer involved is or well he, he yeah he's a cop on the server too that his character is virtually him it is basically him, it's a mix of him and his sister who is a real life cop um so there's nothing wrong with that but you know, a, a character that's well developed and whatnot, other people could essentially play it too. I don't know. I, I feel like with roleplay, you could just keep talking about it because there's just so much about it and so much enjoyable about it. And even the chat, I could see some of the. They could probably go on about it too. And that is a whole nother thing. Of course, Jack, I didn't realize that you also were on a stream that is a D&D &D stream. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, we wanted adventurers, and uh, the best games period has like a sub role-playing podcast called dragon guard okay yeah i had to check that out maybe i think i think cool Pretty fun just saying yeah dang it something else to add to my list <laughs> uh, um so yeah uh to, to circle apparently my camera went drunk um uh yeah no so the only other side effect and i don't know if anyone else that's rp that has the side effect is for the last uh, night, last night with the exception, but last Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when I logged in to do my shifts, uh, shifts, I'm, I was playing, but, um, I ended up being dispatched for our police department. So now a lot of calls I hear, I can't help but hear it in 10 code and, uh, codes two, three, and four and, um, dispatching code. Yeah. My thoughts have gone that way the last few couple days. So that's, happened. I don't know. Has anyone else had the experience with their RPs where... You're oh, suddenly you like, start to make... yeah. Sorry, no, I'm just trying to talk you over you. No, no, no. Go ahead. It's just like yeah, getting inside your character's heads. Totally, totally, totally. Because I'm like, for one campaign, I had to play this uh, very divergent Jedi. She was starting to really reassess a lot of things, and like, I know that I talk about philosophy and religion at times on Twitter, but like I had not thought about it as hard as I did as this fictional character was mulling over what where she stood in the universe and everything, what the hell she was gonna deal with, her psychotic ex master and everything, and just like you start to be like, Am I putting too much thought into this? Or is this just, you know, what Daniel Day Lewis does every day of his life? <laughs> uh <laughs> Yeah, like I, so the reason I thought of it is um, the the whole different subject. I Crafty and I went out for for an errand and whatnot today. And when we stopped one place, one of the places we stopped, there was a dog in the car with uh, no with windows up and everything. And we had to call the police. Department. We had to actually call the police about it. And as I was hanging up, like I was as I was talking to the dispatcher, I was like, I just I just heard my conversation I had with her in the dispatch code that she's going to tell the officer over the radio yep I've, I've <laughs> penetrated my character's head well enough where it interfered with my own thought process for a moment it's like yeah you're going to 76 to the mall or what I I don't know <laughs> yeah yeah I have definitely had similar experiences where like my mindset for a character kind of bleeds over into like my average life and although when it has happened like more vividly it was while I was playing a serial killer character 
Um, oh. He, he was, Concerns. He was, All of a sudden, this, uh, this recording is being taped by, uh, by certain <laughs> governments. He he was uh, he was like the second son of a very wealthy family who had made a pact with a demon after incorrectly summoning it, and it had just like destroyed his entire family and like bound him to this oath to essentially like sacrifice an innocent to this demon once every month in order to keep living, um, and so like that's kind of like his priority was always like making sure he had like that one person near him like he could shiv when the time came right and uh yeah it was not a pleasant thought process uh but like there were times where i'd be like yeah that person they're a little bit too alone they shouldn't be that alone <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. I, Not that I was going to kill them, okay? Wanna be clear. Wanna be clear. <laughs> I suppose uh the the flip side of that though is that, that if you're if you have that thought process, it just means that you have penetrated your character that well and um your ability to play that character is just that much better because you've you've hit that that like oasis of role play where uh it's it's the right spot and you can just roll with it and uh I I especially with, with that it. But I'm team. See, Elisha, that's how you do a pun. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to say. Oh. oh, sorry. I was just going to say, it was also really fun because none of the other players in my group knew that my character was a serial killer. We mm. would just, they would just find random bodies around sometimes. Wow. And like my <laughs> character would be like, oh my gosh, there's a terrible crime afoot. <laughs> terrible crime afoot. <laughs> Oh but gosh! Saying about the killer bit actually reminded me that it wasn't from role playing; it was from playing Dishonored because I always get really immersed whenever I play my first run through of a Dishonored game. After playing Dishonored two, I just naturally carry things like Corvo and his daughter. Seriously, I just do this now. Sometimes my my mom we've seen is like, "What are you going to go stab someone?" And it's like, "No." I Maybe just played the video game, funny. and now I naturally carry it this way. <laughs> Uh, God, I feel like this could be a whole tangent that we can just keep going on, but I, mm -hmm. yeah. So the to 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 wrap it up, like that conversation is like the extent of of like my RP the last few weeks is that much versus some of the other games. Um, although of course I've also played some Elite Dangerous. We went back out on an exploration expedition, which has been fun. We've been to four nebulas so far, and we're going on the nebula nebula exploration. And uh, it's been it's been fun. Seeing we're doing astrophotography too as we're getting close. We take screenshots, Ooh. and uh, I think part of what I've enjoyed about that is as we start doing that, we get members of the community uh, into Discord and ask them to upload some of their favorite shots. And I've we've seen some fantastic screenshots from Elite. I don't care what anyone says, that game is gorgeous when it comes to screenshots. It's really pretty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, so I've that. And then there's been some VR, but done some Beat Saber. And then uh, another one is uh, I, I got it from one of my fellow officers uh, in the RP. She was streaming. Um, it's called Synth Riders. It's another VR um, music rhythm game, but instead of like smashing at things, you move your hands to um, meet different balls that are on the screen, right? And you can either do left hand, right hand. A single hand or double hand and uh yeah the game is intense but it's got original music uh it's a lot of fun and you really feel the calories burn when you're playing it i really really enjoyed it no no uh to correct chat not sith riders synth riders like synthesis or yeah that synth riders uh, I mean, i'm sure there are sith oh i'm sure there are companies. sith riders uh, but yeah, no, I've truly enjoyed it. I will definitely be playing more of it, and I am very grateful to Carice Hunter for sharing that with me. So thank you for that. I very much enjoy the game. And if you are at all interested in VR uh, music synth games or music rhythm games, I would highly encourage you checking out the game, because I'm willing to bet you will have a good time. And that is what I've been playing. Additionally with that, 
before we start diving into subjects, uh, we've actually been live for an hour and a half already. <laughs> so this is a we, this is probably the longest intro to what we've been talking about we've had, but that's what it is. Sorry. No, no, no. Don't be don't be sorry. I think this works out perfect. Be so honored. Yeah. Be honored. Yeah. No, it works out great. The the segments work out perfect this way. Um. So for everyone that's watching live. Uh, this is where we're going to encourage you to get up, take a break, stretch, whatever it is that you have to do. But don't go too far. We'll be back with the Noobcast podcast in a short bit. Gesticulate everywhere. You know, sometimes I wonder why everyone puts up with that. I really do. I really, really do. <laughs> I mean, right now, I have no energy to fight against this. <laughs> <laughs> How would you if you did? That's that's fair. That's fair. Uh, um, everyone, welcome back to the Noobcast podcast round two, and uh, we got gaming news and other topics coming up in this segment of the show. Um, and putting up with Elijah's jazz hands. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I gotta say, I don't know about about Elijah, because Elijah and I are usually the ones that compile the news headlines for the show, and. I had one hell of a time. Like there, are, there are definitely headlines, but they're like, "Yes, this happened," and that's it. It's like, the, what is there for discussion in news? There's, there hasn't been a whole lot, so I, I put together some like brief ones. It's like, "Oh yeah, this happened." Like for instance, uh, there have been th two billion Mario Maker levels that have been released since uh, it came out, which is with uh, a B. Yeah, with a B. There's a billion, billions. Two billion. Billions. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of levels. That is, isn't it though? That that's insane. That is. Now the only thing I didn't, I couldn't find is how many levels that compares to, in regards to the original Mario Maker. But I think it speaks to the popularity of the game. It's literally all of the original Mario Maker levels have been ported over, and they just didn't want to say anything about it. I mean. That, I mean, that's entirely possible. <laughs> I mean, theoretically, like, there are so many levels that you could play for the rest of your life and not even touch them all. That's, that, that just... <clears throat> it's yeah. the whole alternate universe. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what if Mario Brothers 3 was actually this? And then you just go through a segment of 20 levels of mm -hmm. just, like, fan-made... That's that's parallel universe one one four two eight nine alpha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so that's that's what I mean. Like, there's stuff like that, right? Or there's a Splatoon, Tetris ninety nine, whatever. Um, there was a couple things about Fire Emblem. Yes, Elijah. Yeah. I don't mean to undercut the Fire Emblem fans. I did want to say though, if you were a fan of Halo. If you're tired of waiting for the Master Chief to like Halo SPV 3.2 just dropped, yeah. which is amazing. They've added an Arbiter level. They've actually added six whole new levels to the original Halo. It takes 24 hours to finish Halo Combat Evolved to mod install. And they've actually streamlined the installer to the point that all you need to do is make sure that you have your old PC CD key and then you can just pretty much play it. So like, that's a thing. You should look it up. The trailer is amazing. It's taken over a decade of development, but these guys have done it, and Microsoft's actually signed off on it. It's not going to get DM'd or anything. It's all, yeah, that. Sorry, Fire okay. Emblem. Yeah, no, uh, that. I mean, that's. A, but again, that's just kind of what I'm talking about, right? That like that's a tidbit. That that's the thing that dropped. Yay, cool. Um, hopefully, Master Chief Collection comes out. Uh, there was uh, two parts with Fire Emblem though. They got the three houses, and then you had the uh, you can woo people of the same gender, which a inclusiveness. Finally, yeah. It took them long enough. I, I'm surprised it did take this long, but yay for doing it. And I'm I'm just I, I'm I'm just, I'm just gonna be glad when it's the day that you can just do it, and it's not like hey, this is a headline that you can do this now. It's just just do it. You know? It was just there on launch, and everybody was okay. Yeah, like if you knew that, that would be fantastic. Um, you know, that's the acclaim of like something you could do with Mass Effect because you could do that ten years ago in Mass Effect, and you know, it was. Imagine it, if that were. It wasn't a headline yeah. for it though, right? It wasn't a headline for Mass Effect. It was just like, by the way, bleh, you know, no, someone I mean, found out. I uh, no, it was kind of, 
Did it, was it though? A big deal. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, they didn't. Oh, well, well, hold on. They didn't press release it. People covered it. It wasn't press released though. Oh yeah, no, it was not a press release. Right. Yeah. Before there was that one guy claiming you could screw anybody, which obviously no, you can't. That was a whole debacle. But um, there is actually another side of the Fire Emblem thing I was curious to hear, which is that I'm not sure how everyone's heard, but there's actually been some backlash to your options, especially for male male love interests. Apparently, a lot of them are your dad's friend. It's kind of weird. That's and like one of the female weird. options is the obligatory Fire Emblem. She looks like she's ten, but she's a ten thousand year old dragon. We swear, officer. Yeah. They really uh, need to stop you relying on that trope. Yeah. It's, it, it's just... It, it doesn't fly. Mm, it doesn't yeah. fly anymore. Mm -mm. That's... Uh, I, but I, I, that's, that's the way that some of the characters in the game have been since... You know, you got the, the uh, experienced knights and you got these uh, innocent-looking female characters that just... Um, so yeah, old male experienced and young looking, uh, but apparently also experienced female character. I, who knows how that works out, but that's what they do. And nonetheless, that's, uh, that's kind of the tidbit there. And then, um, Gears of War 5 is cutting all references to smoking. I don't know why Ferguson is making such a, like, it got to the point that he just, when people were asking him, why are you making a big deal out of this? He just kind of got quiet on Twitter and then he was like, my dad died at this age from, from smoking. And it's like, I lost a grandfather, a very beloved grandfather to smoking, so like, I should sympathize with this, but the way he presented it was just sort of like, leave me alone, and I've now decided this is how we're ending the conversation sort of thing, so. Mm. It's Interesting. Le I mean, like, I'm okay with them cutting it, I don't really miss yeah. it, but it's, it's really head scratchy why they're making such a huge deal out of this. This is even more a weird thing to make a big deal out of than proper representation. Proper representation at least give some props, but like not including smoking in your game. You don't you don't get a merit badge for that. Well, see, and yeah, I I mean it's given the world and everything. Like it's not unsurprising that it would be there. Like it's 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 a post-apocalyptic hell world that it makes sense it would be there. And I mean. You know, I, I think the one interesting take that I have on this is that I think Gears of War Gears of War is marketed towards like children, essentially. Like, yeah, it is a post apocalyptic hellscape and there are like there is blood and gore and guts and mature themes, but like at the end of the day it is marketed towards kids and so I think it's like this interesting convergence of like how we are okay with kids experiencing extreme violence but then we also get into this well think of the children mentality for a game like gears of war yeah. you know well, right because of smoking well it's, and, and the thing is is like the whole uh think of the children argument in general with gaming is always has always fallen flat, fallen right on its face because it just doesn't it doesn't tread water it just doesn't and uh, more there are so many different um, case studies that you can't even point a stick at them all that show that that's not an issue uh, now that said I think that a personal choice because of how it personally affected you and it's your story whatever you know sure do your thing yep I also feel like it's worth mentioning that up until this point, the Gears of Five marketing has actually been pretty good at seeming like, because like you said, yeah, a lot of them have been advertised towards children. I think four they were trying it a little bit, but um, five is the first one where the marketing campaign has been weirdly more emotional and like story centric versus look at all the ways you can chainsaw a locust. So it's a very odd backward step to just make a big deal out of this. Because, like, I mean, their E3 trailer was literally about, you know, a character grappling with psychosis and stuff like that. And now we're talking about whether or not smoking happens and someone's texting you. Of course they are. Hold on. Ow. I mean, in, in fairness, a, a ding to a point is, is very appropriate on that. <laughs> yeah, no. And... 
I, I think of stuff like I don't know. Like I, I think there is a place to have the the less than ideal scenario in your game. Like I think Gears of War makes a lot of sense that way. Um, I think Metal Gear Solid. It's been very interesting how they use cigarettes as a theme to explain certain things in the story. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And see, I feel like that... you would lose a piece, right? If and... You didn't have that as part of it. Well, it, yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I like. I don't feel like you have to just cut it you know like I, I feel like that that would be such a non-issue no one would even like bat an eye on it wait so so did epic announce that they were removing smoking oh there was a press release for yep what i i guess <laughs> why why do that and that's that's the whole point right it's it like it's obviously like an attempt to win like brownie points, but like you were saying, Elijah, like you don't. It, it's 2019. You don't get a medal for that anymore. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, look, if it was Metal Gear Solid uh, in 1997, yeah, sure. I mean, it would have probably impacted the story and everything else because of how it worked uh, to Diz's point. But uh, um, now. Uh, ooh. Crafty's actually raising a valid point in the chat. Apparently, Stranger Things was actually getting some shit for having smoking in it, which it's like, it's a series set in the 80s. Smoking was a big thing then. Yeah. Like, I mean, they've cut out a lot. They've even shown a queer character. I'm not going to say who, but they've shown a queer character in this most recent Spoilers. season. Spoilers! Without a blink. And that was just, you know, back in the day, that wouldn't have been just with a casual blink and then not uh, moving forward, just like how they haven't had racism. So, like, I feel like Stranger Things should have gotten away with just having smoking, but apparently that might have been the motivation for them being like, and we're not going to have it. We won't stand for it. We're better than Stranger Things. <laughs> Cancel your Netflix subscription and buy Xbox Game Pass. <laughs> I hope someone clips that. I just hope someone clips that. No, look. The Captain America shirt really <laughs> <laughs> it really does it, 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 as far as like Stranger Things like I didn't realize there was a backlash to it because who cares like oh there's a lot of smoke no shit it was in the 80s w like when you went to a restaurant in the 80s the one thing you were asked smoking or non-smoking like that was a thing it, in fact by doing that it's more authentic, authentic to the period so screw people are getting upset about it uh, the fact that they did a press release for Gal 5, like, I, I mean, the, here's your clap for, for making an issue of it, but it really doesn't matter. If, if you decided to include it, again, it fits the era of the time where people are going to look for things to cope, and yes, it's not healthy, but people use it to cope. Who I cares? Mean, I, could, I could make, I, I could see it maybe being important if, like, we were back in the time where like smoking was everywhere on tv and it was everywhere uh, in advertisements and it was everywhere in like all forms of media and we were like just finding out that oh it causes lung cancer everybody it's actually really bad like maybe if we we're in the midst of that sort of like a reveal sure um, like this would be more laudable i guess but now it's just kind of like Hey. Well, yeah, we, we we know. Yeah, maybe maybe if you did a press release saying that you took vaping out of your your game, then you'd have more of a valid <laughs> yeah, point. Yeah, they, they took all the jewels out of it. Yeah. Game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, way to go, San Francisco. Yep, yeah, that's that's what your game is based off of, San Francisco. Um. Yeah. So I guess that turned into a little bit more than just a tidbit, but that was what I had for tidbits. Um, talking about the controversies of things, though. Um. Elijah, you want to help out leave with this one and uh, G2A? Oh, G2A? Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Where to <laughs> start with this? Okay, so long story <laughs> short, key resellers have been a thing for a while, and among the pile of neutral ones, G2A is just straight up chaotic evil. Like, seriously, there's some that are just like, they're not super legit, but I understand some people have had to resort to them. But g2a is just awful like they seem to actively make the worst choices possible we actually covered them a while back when gearbox tried to make a collector's edition version of bulletstorm remastered would be exclusively through g2a because 
that's just how bad it is that Gearbox even, you know, approached them and then backed away. Gearbox said, oops, we made a mistake. That tells you just how low <laughs> D2A is. And they are notorious for using keys that don't work, keys that were used with stolen credit cards, keys that have given chargebacks. So they've actually cocked developers. There's one case where I heard it cost them over $6,000. There's somewhere it has gone higher. Yeah, than yeah. In fact, that was uh, the developers of Factiro that were impacted that way, and uh, G two uh, yeah, A is agreed just... to pay that back to a degree. Yeah, yeah. Supposedly, G two A is claiming they're now suddenly trying to do like they think they're actually doing good press. They think that they're making things better by um doing these things like, well, if certain number of developers agree to this certain thing, then we'll do that to ensure things are good. Like, they'll make programs to scan for the keys and everything and stuff like that, and supposedly they're going to pay everyone back more than double what they were lost, but the people behind Factorio have actually said, yeah, we sent an email, like, over two days ago, we've not heard a single thing back. So it's, it's like, G2A! One of the scummiest places you could possibly go to. Like, they all, even when it comes to their sponsorships, they tend to go for, like, the scummiest corners of YouTube. I can just, yeah, it's, there's no way to describe the site positively. But the reason that it came up such a big deal is because Google, for some reason, in their infinite wisdom, decided, hey, let's put G2A at the top of search results for games that are PC copies. So that people think that that's a legitimate website. People who would have never known that G2A existed, who would have normally just gone to Steam or Origin or GOG. Hell, Humble. Now it's the point where people like Raimi is Molly is like, yeah, I'd rather you pirate my games instead of pay a G2A. You are actually saving me money and better supporting the experience. When well, piracy is actually more supportive, that tells you something. Well, and... Then there's the whole controversy around them soliciting, like trying to pay off journalists oh, yeah. to to give them positive, positive coverage. Pre- yeah, that that was insane. And supposedly, supposedly, it's the result of just like a rogue employee oh, at G two A, and they oh, had yeah. nothing to do with it. Oh, of it's course, like that one rogue employee, like that one, you know, rogue employee who's in charge of the Twitter account for that senator from, uh, or congressman rather from Texas, who just happened to like a porn video on Twitter. Mm, no, that was, was that was a senator. That was a senator. Yeah, I, I, I always forget who who which thing Cruz is. I remember that he d- he did that and makes very bad policy choices. That's yep. Funny. Yeah, no, uh, you're you're at, you're 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 exactly right. You know, the funny thing is, is like uh, the fact that that occurred with like the paying off, paying off press is like you know, some people already had some trust issues with press, uh, game like gaming news press. Like anyone that took that that money, that is, look, that is essentially dirty money. Like I don't care what you say, that is fucking dirty money. You shouldn't touch it. You should disinfect it and just like throw it in a fire at that point because that's just how because you're not doing anyone any favors you're not doing your publication any favors by by writing that article you're not doing g2a any favors because when it got out it made them look even scummier than they already did which that by the way is impressive to do um but yeah no i, I mean this this is just i i i wish this was them circling the toilet before the final flush i know it's not but god i wish it were oh it would be lovely if it were and the thing is i'm not liking some of the suggestions that i'm seeing to compensate for this like there was um pc gamer ran a piece where it's like the solution is to just get rid of keys and it's like no because there are people who use like their humble monthly keys and everything legitimately like Imagine if you couldn't just be like, okay, I have a bunch of redundance in this month, a month, full monthly. I'm going to give it out to a couple different friends. We start making it so that it instantly redeems to your account. You lose that option. And that's just, it's like, that is really not how to combat this. We, If anything, it's kind of beyond the developer side of things. It's more to do with how we handle credit card theft and chargebacks, which unfortunately is kind of out of the game industry's hands because that's more of a financial issue that the world market needs to get its shit together on. 
that yeah, happen. no, I, yeah, that, 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 mm, that's a mess in of itself. Um, because I mean, when you start talking about chargebacks and how that impacts, I mean, there's so many of us that have been affected about that, especially if you're a content creator, you likely fallen victim of that too. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, uh, I mean, I think we covered pretty much everything with that particular art, uh, case or that study or that story, but yeah, uh, moral of the story don't buy your games from G2A. I, in fact, um, I would say I'd rather see you buy it from Epic. That says something. From what? Epic. Oh, Epic. My goodness. That is, that is, <laughs> that is a sign of growth, I think. No. No, that just tells you how much I would rather see G2A just flush is I'd rather see you buy from Epic. Well, I mean, there are, there, there, one of the other things that is worth talking about in news lately is something that should resolve some of your issues with the many, many applications and also help maybe push people Yes, away. I was, Doing. uh, yeah, I suppose this is perfect, right? Going right into, uh, <laughs> the GOG story. Yeah, GOG 2.0 and the fact that they have... Uh, it in beta and they're doing things like tutorials on how to use it properly and the fact they'll show your entire library if you so choose you can filter out things it is really really nice I really like that plus I've not had any I don't know about the three of you I've not had any problems trying to use the GOG store or, or anything from good old oh, games their, their, their normal Galaxy client is fantastic so 2.0 mm -hmm. it seems Plus, mm -hmm. I love that they're even working on getting. They apparently have it at a basic level. They're working on chat integration across all platforms because, oh, thank goodness. Then, if I actually want to talk to someone that I met over Xbox and we don't happen to have microphones at the ready at the moment, I can type with a keyboard instead of on this. <laughs> that would be beautiful. Yeah, the cross, cross platform support's really nice, too. Um, there's a lot of this. Uh, in fact, I just pulled up the list here. Uh, you can add bookmarks, friends added to the tutorial screen, fixed issues with friends, recommendations not displaying from the original platform, scrolling through activities, the ability to hide games from the library, build, uh, added platform to icon to tooltips library. Uh, and it just goes on and on. Uh, added a platform icon recently played games, which is nice. So if there's a game that you're on, uh, on a kick with, like, say, GTA RB, it'd be right there and be like, aha, I found it instead of because even Steam, you have to scroll through and find the damn game in the listing. And if you have as many oh. games as we've got, th that's a long list. That warrant's also mentioning that apparently Steam is planning on changing how the library works. And if I can be quite honest here, based on the leaked screens that have been confirmed as being fairly legit, mm. it looks like a pain in the ass. Like, genuinely, it looks more cluttered, less ideal. And that's why I'm also really glad to have an alternative layout to refer to, because that is the one thing GOG is really good at, is that it's like, you don't want huge icons, yep. you don't want trailer previews, which is apparently that's the thing Steam is now testing. They're planning on making micro trailers that will play whenever you browse over any game. And oh. it's like, you don't want big icons, you just want to be able to access your games quickly and swiftly. Okay, we'll do that. So, like... Now, many trailers in like say the store like if there's a if there's a game art that grabs your attention you mouse over it you get a quick like six second trailer that's one thing i don't want it if i'm going through my library though like i already know what I my game is i don't know if it's going to be in the library itself, okay but realistically it's just like i think they're trying to copy the xbox store but the thing is xbox does it a lot better where there's like a trailer and it just plays in the background while you're looking at the thing you've yeah. already selected it you're looking at it, and then you can just go upwards and listen to the audio if you want. Otherwise, you could just be reading the details, and there's gameplay in the background. That's completely fair, but I'm just thinking of, like, the bandwidth and everything that's going to be eaten up by having to preload all of those trailers whenever you're browsing through the Steam store, and just like, no, I don't have time for this. I don't... If I want to see a trailer, there are ways for me to look up a trailer very easily, even on your storefront. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's GOG might be coming in at just the right time for that too. Yeah, uh, I I think that there's a lot of potential here, and uh, because of the things that causes Epic Game Store to not get good press, and GOG is just like, yeah, we'll just let you do your thing. Oh, you want all your games in one place? By the way, 
because of all these other launchers. Here, we'll just we'll let you see your other games so they're all collected, even if they're on different clients. That, yeah, thank you. That's that's the funny thing. It sounds like some of the stuff that they're trying to fix and add into GOG 2.0 is just some of the stuff that the customers want. Like, is that is that a bad thing? Is that a bad thing that they they're like, oh, you want that? Okay. I don't think so. I I do think though that like the end purpose of all of this is to get more people to use GOG. Like oh, it, yeah. it's it's a brilliant marketing tactic and it's kind of shocking that like Steam didn't get ahead of this or like Epic didn't get ahead of this. Um but you know, I'm glad someone is because like it's a free PR win and you get to basically while showing a modicum of support for these other platforms, you get basically everyone into your ecosystem. So it's a huge mm -hmm. win. Yeah. yeah. It's like, is it good marketing or is it a good product though? I think at the end of the day, I think what they're trying to sell you on is getting onto their, their client. And that is a very meaningful way to solve a big problem. And, mm -hmm. and when in fairness, whenever I hear this is really good marketing, I think, okay, but marketing doesn't have anything behind it. This is actually something functional behind it. Right. Right. Um, I, I guess, I mean, it's going to generate good marketing. That is true. Um, I also think that it, it's fascinating because the thing is, there almost were other people to beat them to the punch on this, and that's the thing that's kind of surprised me. For a while there, it almost looked like Discord was going to go that route before they mm -hmm. kind of went away from that. Though I will give Discord credit that, like, when it comes to actually keeping people in the loop on a game's updates and everything, they're actually better as a newsletter client than pretty much anything else. Whenever there's a new thing happening to Warframe, Battlefront, or Destiny, they're where I'm going to end up more likely looking now than Twitter, which is impressive on their part. But yeah, it's just, it's like, it's, we're reaching this point where just offering middleware is kind of its own product again. And there was a time when that was very much a standard thing, and it's just sort of cycling in again, I guess. Yeah, no, I, that's, that's true. And as far as like that middleware and talking about that, though, like, there's other platforms that have tried to do that, uh, right? Like, even if, like, for instance, this this podcast is done over discord if you go to your main page of discord it does the same thing where it's like oh you play this game a lot here's articles related to that game that you play um but the fact that god does that with, along with everything else that yeah i'm i'm impressed i'm intrigued i i like that where that's going so yay yay positive thing i'm glad to see it um I'm, i hope that maybe you three are also maybe kind of sort of I already use GOG, so it's like, okay. Let's give them support and give more of these platforms a reason to say, oh wait, giving things that, that customers want is a good idea. Let's let's see some real innovation now that we have this competition in yes. the market. Yes. Yeah, I I don't know. I'm always wary about the consolidation of um people into like one marketplace which is kind of what this does but on the other hand it's something that a lot of people want so right now it seems good and that's kind of where i'm at like it could be bad down the road but right sure. now it's good that's a oh, yeah. that's a good point yeah. too yeah that's a really good I point really agree and also just like that's even why i was actually that was the reason i was happy for epic was just simply someone shook steam enough that they woke up and now it's going to be kind of curious because it feels like the ball is in play, and I'm just hoping it stays in play, like you're, like we're saying here, because that's a healthy situation. Whereas if it just falls into another net, then we're just screwed for another ten years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be concerned about this sort of consolidation if it was, you know, requiring you to to get things on GOG going forward or something like that. Mm -hmm. There, there's nothing that's predatory about this. I think it's it's very open. It's very like like at face good. And even if somebody 
literally got nothing on the GOG platform, they could still organize their stuff this way. And this could be a free tool. And maybe that's what happens and GOG gets nothing out of it. That's, that's the other possibility too, where mm-hmm. that takes place. And then GOG is just stuck out here having invested all of his time and money into making this option and nothing comes of it. So the question will be, how much of a benefit do they actually see? How much of it will they be able to attribute to this? Mm -hmm. And then going forward, what are the other options thinking about this and and what is their next play? That's a, that's a very good point. And, uh, but we've discussed this on the show before, right? We've, we've talked about that, right? So one of the big things with, in regards to Epic and what the things that to do and how people are like, oh, don't buy from Epic, da, 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 da. And it's like, <clears throat> the question came up is, so what if a company does what you want them to do? The answer is go buy from them, give them financial support because they are actually listening to you. Will I be more inclined to buy games from GOG over other platforms? Yes, yes I will. Uh, or the fact that they offer some of the stuff I, I love the fact that I've got classic Blizzard games again because of them uh, and that's just, that's something entirely different I realize but it's something else and I'll be going back to the platform for other games so yes yes I'm no, all done no, for the it's... sorry it just, it, it, what you're saying here it, I would say it does connect so it all loops back together it is all one business and like they were very happily touting that you know like I think it was like a third of all Cyberpunk 2077 sales for pre-orders was through gov directly so like they are actually gaining some clout and apparently it's very good for them they did because for a brief time they were very close to being in the red when they were laying off some employees apparently it was very sure. close to the whole thing just going bye-bye but now they're kind of on a return and so it's it's going to be interesting seeing how they handle that because this is not only them expanding into a bigger marketplace but also just sort of like this is their big second chance to make things work so lots of interesting question marks this is something we're doubtless going to be coming back to in a few months once things have evolved further yeah yeah all right cool uh right so shifting gears a little bit talking about uh platforms and and such there's another type of platform there was a recent uh leak that there was going to be a new switch coming out in september and we are looking at a switch light a 30 percent smaller version of the switch that does not deck to the tv uh and this may be a sign along with other things that the 3ds is finally at end of life what are your thoughts on this upcoming Switch? And uh, if you don't already own a Switch, will you end up with this one? So I've given this a little bit of thought because, especially with the last game, presumably, like it'll end up being the Swan being a Persona game. I, I feel like I have to put in my two cents. Persona. And it's inevitable. It is. Um, it will be the one game that finally gets me to get my 3DS out again, which I think should probably say where the 3DS is in standing anyways. I mean, it makes sense. I will say as a matter of function, I think Nintendo potentially has some real issues on its hands. And... I mean this because of the way that the Joy-Cons work. And specifically, there are a lot of games that expect motion controls off of those. And a lot of customers, and rather, a lot of the demographics, it's going to be parents of kids who are buying those games, are not going to understand that this game is not going to be compatible with the light. Mm. That, that's the single biggest concern that I have. Okay. Is that you're trying to educate a population that is not even games as to what's going to work and not going to work on your console they do not make it simple they do not make it easy for the purchaser to know that this is not going to be light compatible and that is a problem that's interesting no that it, being said, I, I suppose it depends on how you play it because like for myself um i don't play my switch on my tv like my deck is really just my docking station um 
I usually play on the console itself. But you present a good counterpoint that there's some motion involved. Like, how does that, how does that play an effect? Like, do you just like with your screen if you're trying to throw out the pokeball or there's what? No rumble or anything apparently. There's like mm. none of the motion that is going to be in there. There might be. I might, I might have missed that part then. The thing that's really unclear for me is that there's been some indication that you might still be able to use separate Joy Cons because they've said that oh you could have Joy Cons but you have to charge them separately. So. There might be the chance that you'll still be able to do it, but then you'll have to look around second controls for it, which just seems really clunky. Yeah, yeah it's, it's entirely counterintuitive, even if it's possible, which I believe, if I recall the announcement correctly, is the case. I don't think it's worth the time. Yeah, I mean, I personally like it, but I can see... I can see a ton of problems with the basic concept itself like if if the leaks are true like hey a a switch that has you know a half hour longer battery life that's a pretty big deal to me like i connect my switch to the tv very often um but i i don't know i i think it could work especially if they add support for your 3DS games, for example. Like, you're able to import your 3DS library to your Switch. I, yeah, would, buy, actually... I would buy that in an instant. Sure. Oh, well, see, that's a, that's an interesting concept. Can you do that? So, like, for myself, most of my uh, 3DS games are hard copies. You know, I'm, I'm just at right point where I prefer my hard copies over... Um, just downloads unless it's PC. I mean, that's that's been a thing. But like, it's, would there be a slot for it then? I mean, would well, that work? The thing is, Maybe. there is actually a, a precedent for this. There was almost a 3DS add-on for the Wii U. It apparently was prototyped and everything, but it never actually materialized. Like, it was going to be their last ditch ever to try to sell people on the Wii U. Was seriously going to be like, okay, damn it, you can play DS and DS games on it now. Are you happy? Because they already had. DS functionality because it was two screens at once mm -hmm. and that would be the only real issue of getting 3DS games on a Switch Lite would simply be supporting the 3D sort of games and sort of stuff like that that would be the only real logistical hurdle but they've already done games where you hold it this way so it, it's possible and I, I know there's people who've done emulation on other systems where it's like they've made the DS work even though they only have one screen but yeah that would actually be way more interesting for me because right now Speaking as the only, I think the only person here who does not have a Switch at all, they really mostly, if you're not a huge Nintendo fan, <laughs> mostly what they're selling me on is games that I already own. Like, it's portable, but at that point, yeah, this light is about the only thing that's really exciting, because then you have, like, Alien Isolation on the go. But besides that, the light still kind of has the same issue that anyone, one who wasn't already interested in the Switch still has, where it's just sort of like, it's, you really need to have an investment in Nintendo to be super excited for it. I mean, I think Nintendo's been doing a really good job of expanding its indie library. Oh, yeah. And I think now, like, instead, I, I think up until, like, maybe the last several months, um, people were primarily buying a lot of their indie titles on PC, um, occasionally some Xbox and PlayStation 4 stuff through, like, you know, their free games being given away. But I think Nintendo is kind of trying to set itself up to be this indie destination. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, like, I can see this uh, light handheld being a perfect kind of on-the-go device for all of those uh, games that aren't necessarily triple A, but are um, kind of... An indie boutique. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it fits really nicely into that niche, and I think if they could, like, whether it's through a specialized cartridge slot that plays DS and 3DS games, or like a way that it can like register your hard copies and then download them to your uh, Switch Lite. I think that that would be a brilliant win. I think that that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I don't. I don't know that it even has that functionality. But 
if you wanted it to have that wider appeal and give it like a bigger library, I think you could definitely do something like that. Yeah, I think you hit on a really good point when talking about indie titles, because I don't know of any indie titles that specifically take advantage of the sort of controls that would require the full on switch. Mm hmm. Well, I think uh, I think to that extent, I think that's kind of been a, an issue with with third party support on Nintendo consoles since the Wii, right? Like that's just Nintendo has that down pat, and that's why games on the Wii and Wii U have been successful. And um, or just just the uh, first party games, right? And third parties kind of fell by the wayside. And we were talking about this uh, last the last episode where the big thing Nintendo got with the switch and it's like oh there's uh the witcher 3 coming out on switch and everyone's like oh the switcher 3 on, wi on switch and it's like they're excited because these people are excited because they're getting major third-party support on a console that previous nintendo consoles for a while hasn't received they haven't gotten it since the gamecube right um and that's true developers like so with the indie developers they're not optimizing for motion controls and touch screens and everything else that, that the Switch, Wii, Wii U, whatever has. They're just going, our game is on this console. Go go play it. And uh, so to Jack's point, yeah, uh, because indie developers aren't use, utilizing the gimmicks of the Switch and just going, hey, this is a great platform to play our game on, the Lite would be a fantastic option for that then. And it's even more more accessible because big thing about the switch and the one gimmick that is uh translatable is it can go on the go well so... and, and it's just selling like crazy right now like mm -hmm. i i think that really helps and i think if it keeps going down that path a lot of those indie games that are coming out on you know pc or other other platforms will be giving serious consideration to going uh, platform exclusive, in which case that becomes even more of an incentive to buy, you know, a, a Switch Lite. You know, mm -hmm. who do we think the demographic really is for the Lite? Like, who 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 does Nintendo want to full or to get the regular Switch, and who is it that Nintendo sees that that's worth targeting specifically to the Lite? And I think. I I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm thinking, because you're saying this, like, honestly, part of it is just the handheld market, because it just saves them time and money if they just have a same exact operating system, so there's that a fair bet, because, like, a person who owns a mainline Switch, at least to some extent, wants it as a home console, whereas this light is being advertised completely as a handheld option, also as a discount option, and we've seen with the 2DS, the first 2DS, they are perfectly happy to make a downgraded console that sells well because 2DSs are still sold. Like, I can go to my local Walmart where they have next to nothing, but they will make sure that they have 2DSs in stock because they just sold that well. It's a brick in your hands, but it was an entire console for, like, 80 to 60 bucks. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it's geared more towards children. Um, like there are less moving parts to break there it's much more intuitive to hold on to and i think that uh much like with the 2ds like the appeal is that it is probably more durable it has a longer battery life like it it has these features and it's also just simpler to use because you don't have to you know, with the Switch, there's the question, like, do you, oh, do you connect it to the sides of the console? Are you going to slip it into the controller? Are you going to connect the Pro Pad? Like, what, like, all these different questions that make it a little bit more complicated for a younger person, or maybe even an older person, to play with. And I think when you strip it all down to a purely mobile device that doesn't have all those moving parts, um, it makes it more durable, kind of like removing the hinge um, from the 3DS to make a 2DS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, and that's a fantastic point, too. And, I mean, you're both kind of rounding up the idea that, yeah, it's still something that will be marketable and definitely used. I know that the 2DS has definitely had some popularity. Uh, another thing that 
causes the two. But here's one of the things about the 2DS versus 3DS. I think that causes some of the sales is it's not only more accessible because it's cheaper, but it's more accessible because there's some folks that have issues with the 3D aspect of the 3DS, and mm -hmm. um, because of their conditions, they're just like, you know, I don't want to deal with that, and they just buy 2DS because it's cheaper, and they don't have to put up with the headache from it. Uh, with the Switch, though, um, fewer moving parts means there's fewer chance the fewer chances for things to break which is nice uh honestly like i kind of i what i would love and I, I don't know how feasible it is but i would love if say the switch light was the answer for uh a portable console like the like the 3ds game boys prior to that um and that your save game files and game access is shared between the two switches you know have your have your regular switch that can deck to a TV or play on the go but if you're in a let's say you're traveling and you already have a tight bag and you're like you know I don't want to pack the switch but my switch light will fit, fit fine in and anything that you do on your switch light suddenly it becomes accessible back on the switch when you get back home because I'd be all for that but again that's not I'm, I'm sorry I just I'm listening to this and I'm like yeah I'm too poor to imagine a scenario like this. It must sound very nice, and I imagine the light is going to be very um, good for st just storing away, but just like the idea of even having two switches for me just sounds like complete craziness. Well, primarily it would be for people who I, I think don't have one already. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I truly expect that. But Now, if Nintendo wanted to send me one, I wouldn't I wouldn't put up a fuss about it, but <laughs> right. Uh... No, you're exactly right. I, I mean, the reason I say it though, the reason I brought it up that way is because I'm a person that has a Switch or a Wii U prior to that, and I had a 3DS. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of the stuff I wouldn't mind if had had some type of cross thing that happened. Of course, it wasn't going to happen because there were different consoles. But now that it's the same one, same software. That's that's kind of where that thought process came came from. I realize it's not likely to happen, and there's probably not a lot of people that would have that same thought process. And even if I did end up doing that, it would be something like what you said, Jack, where um, they would I would have to win it or get it from Nintendo or something. It would be like, yeah, sure, we'll do it that way. I'll, I'll roll that way, sure. I mean, I guess I'm kind of curious to see if this is a downgraded version of the Switch, or if it's intended to be like the successor to their handheld mm. generation because I can kind of see that there is a difference between those two things mm -hmm. um, and it, I guess it depends more, I, I, I would have to know more about it and like what their plans are for it um, because if it is a, a downgraded switch that makes it a little bit less interesting to me but if it's supposed to be the successor to their mobile line well that's that implies a bunch of different things uh, to me, anyway. Yeah. No. Okay. So, uh, I, I suppose a quick thing to see out there then, and that with that in mind, there was also some rumors about a Switch XL. Any thoughts on that? If that does come out um, in twenty twenty. Chopped up a lot there. Wop 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 wop. Do you hear me? Words. Are, now words are coming through. Weird. Um. No, I was asking. I was asking. So we had a lot of discussion of the light. Another thing that came out with that Switch news was that the, there's some rumors of a Switch XL was is uh, not going to be in 2019, but if it does, it'll be 2020. Any particular thoughts on a larger version that that comes with it or give me key? I guess I guess what I guess my thoughts on that would be that it would. I mean, the name implies something, but what would make more sense to me is with the Switch like Lite being like the mobile thing, then the Switch XL might be a permanently docked unit. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, like an actual just like home console. Like it would be more like literally called the Switch Home or something like that. It just, you know, because... Yeah, it could be like their half generation step up. Up, you know. Sure. The, the, ah, the yeah, Pro. yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Because then, then they have both sides of the market kind of like 
well, do you want to be more of a mobile person? Then we have the Switch Lite. If you want to be more of a home person, then we have the Switch XL. And then, um, and both of those things do things a little bit more optimized and better than the baseline Switch that does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, all they need to do is make a stronger controller setup for that Switch XL, and you got me sold because. Mm -hmm. While the Joy-Cons are amazing and innovative, they are not designed for these hands. <laughs> no, oh my gosh, thank you, because that's uh, the, literally the first time I held this in my hands, it made them cramp. It was less than 10 minutes, and it was like, what is happening? I have used so many controllers, and this has never happened. What are these metal <laughs> things made of? <laughs> well, just bundle it with, like, PS Pro, you know? Or not PS Pro. Whatever the Pro version of the Nintendo... <laughs> Hand controller is. Uh, mm -hmm. isn't it the Pro controller? Yeah. 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 Pro cool. is in there somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Forty-five percent. So, uh, I guess. Yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. I, I don't know. The fact that it's delayed, I suspect there's some changes that will come to it. Well, who knows what will happen? I guess 2020 will tell. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. Um, going back over to the PC side of things. I don't know if you knew this. There was a big sale. It's called the Steam Summer Sale. People tend to open their yeah. wallets and spend a lot of money. There was a little drama at the beginning of that, wasn't there? Yeah, there was a little bit of drama with that. With uh, it's, it's wish list, patient, patient. yeah, wish lists being deleted and such. That was a that was a thing. Um, but the question I have is, so there's a sale, and it's a pretty popular sale. What did you get? I'll I'll kick it off and tell you that I finally got BattleTech. Ooh, nice. Yeah, I'm very excited to finally play some Battletech, so I'll get around to that eventually, but I did get it. When you do get around to it, you need to let me know if they finally patch uh, the battle mechanics, because the, the cutscenes every time you've executed a move just took so long. Okay. In, when it first came out, and I think they fixed it, but I'm not sure. I'll, I'll make a note of that and let you know. I, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, do we want to punt this to, to Dizza first and tell us what you got from the Steam Summer Sale and what, what did you get? Did you lose your I wish list? I got absolutely nothing. What? You passed your constitution save. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was glorious looking at the full list and being like, you know, I have a couple of big purchases that I'm planning on this summer. These aren't those. I don't need to eat into it any further. There were a couple of uh, tempting sales that I saw on my wish list that uh, that I still look at and maybe have some slight regret. Um, Slime Rancher has always been kind of on the side of the, eh, I want to try this out at some point, but when you have games that you're looking at sinking hundreds of hours into, it's it's a lot easier to say no to other things, is what I found. Sure. Hey, uh, just so you know, go ahead and keep talking. We're gonna see a, a splash on the screen, but keep talking. Keep going. See if what? Just see keep it. going. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think on uh, what else kind of sat there as the ooh, I'm kind of tempted to it. Uh, let's see. I don't think I've got anything off the top that just really, really screamed out during the sale. Yeah, I can tech in. The, the big problem is, like, a lot of the stuff that I am interested in, like, Rain, didn't really... It's it's so new that it didn't really get anything interesting sale-wise. Mm -hmm. Um... For me personally, a lot of my stuff's just gonna sound weird as shit. Um, on the Steam okay. side of things, uh, I I always keep myself under thirty dollars. So the, there's Lego City Undercover. Finally got that. Been looking forward to experiencing that. Forgotten Anne. I keep hearing about how amazing that is. And Blood of Light. So two Square Enix ones. Um, World of the West is an interesting like action RPG that's based based around 
Journey to the West, so that should be fun. Section 8 Prejudice, which is by TimeGate, who are one of my favorite developers who sadly no longer exist, so excited for that because the last time I played the first Section 8, the single player was so laughably, hilariously bad that um, it, it was really just like, oh goodness, they must have had no budget. But supposedly Prejudice fixed everything. Um, Tumbleweed Express is a tower defense where you're on a train. Lost in Vivo is actually a first-person horror game by a uh, young woman. She did it pretty much, if I understand, all by herself. And um, it's got some shooter bits. It's got some very horror bits, so that should be awesome. And um, the t three big ones for me were I finally picked up Hedon, which is a Doom 2 open-source engine-based game that's... um. Medieval fantasy shooter. You play as this big orc girl who just like kicks tons of ass, and it has adds a ton of things that Doom Two never had. Like you can interact with NPCs and befriend them and everything. And there's this really RPG esque element to it, so that's exciting. Um, Tell a Demon, which is a visual novel done in the style of old school Novea sort of art, and then finally a modern Lucas Arts like Office Quest which, for the record, you can actually try free on mobile, and it is hilarious. Like, they, it's it's done up almost like a Pixar short. No one says anything. It's all done, it's all pantomimes and stuff like that. It's this very cutesy aesthetic, and the puzzles are intuitive, yet devious. Like, I, I just in what little I got to try on mobile, I was like, I like you. You have a great sense of humor, whoever made this, and I, I want to see more, so I'm very excited to finally get past the free trial portion and be like, okay, it's time to see whatever else madness happens out of this, just this one guy trying to escape his office full of people weirdly dressed up as either animals or inanimate objects. <laughs> all right. All right, well, it sounds like we all have some stuff to look at, except, oh, wait, Jack. What yeah. Did, what did you get? <laughs> Sorry. I really uh i went for it this time uh mostly because i saw that all the final fantasy stuff was on sale ah. so, <laughs> i bought uh final fantasy 3 through uh 13 lightning returns um Ooh, okay because okay i i like don't have any of those games i've never played any of the 13 games um and I, I figured I this was a perfect shot to get all of them uh, at a relatively cheap price. And uh, I also picked up a bunch of indies that I've been looking at for a really long time. So uh, those include like uh, Ken Follett's uh, Pillar, The Pillars of the Earth, which is Ooh. a video game adaptation of a like, historical novel about building a cathedral in the Middle Ages. Um, there's a game called Heartbeat, which is kind of like a Pokemon-ish game, which looks really cool and neat. Um, I also picked up Edge of Eternity, which is this early access JRPG that looks fairly interesting. Um, also kind of in the Final Fantasy vein. Uh, Earth Defense Force 4.1, the, the Shadow of New Despair, because... Gosh, am I a sucker for Earth Defense Force? Um, Donut County, Anodyne, um, The Seventh Guest. Those were all like super, super cheap. And uh, then I also picked up The Council because that's a game that has looked really weird to me for a long time. And I had a chance to review it, but I passed up just because I didn't have time. Uh, but now I'm finally kind of getting around to having enough time. So I'm excited for that. Um, I also picked up Zero Escape, Zero Time Dilemma, because I've heard really good things about it, and I have no idea what it's about, but I'm all about those adventure puzzle games, so, yeah. So, what you're saying is where, when people use the saying, the sale has come and the walls have opened and the money shall pour forth, you are a living mm -hmm. example of that. Yeah, I, I... Usually I try and avoid even looking at Steam when there's a sale, and this time I was someone mentioned to me like Final Fantasy is on sale. I'm like, 
those. They usually they usually <laughs> sell those for like forty dollars. I, I can't pass that up. Mm -hmm. So so you said everything from three to lightning returns thirteen. Uh yeah, so that includes Final Fantasy three, four, four of the after years, five, six. I already had seven, uh, eight. I already have nine and ten and ten two. Um, I didn't get eleven, and I already have twelve. But then I haven't played any of the thirteens. So Lightning Returns is neat. I can't speak to the other ones, but Lightning Returns, as like mechanically, it plays fascinatingly. It's a really weird experiment. It it was mm -hmm. like all three were really were again like it was a huge discount on like all the Final Fantasy stuff, and so I was like. I can pick up these three games for like fifteen dollars, and that seems like a pretty good steal. And I never gave the first one a fair shake, so maybe now is a good time to like, you know, for this low entry cost, I can go and play the first one and like see why it got two sequels because that's absolutely fascinating to me. So, so it's a hard drive. It's sixty gigabytes for the first one. It actually gets smaller in install the further in you get into the thirteen series. I don't know why. <laughs> I can tell you why it got two sequels, and that's because they had a budget as big for a game that really could not have possibly handled that no matter what. So mm -hmm. they had to find a way. And I encourage you play them like after you're done playing 10, make sure you do like the end of 10 and have like three or four hours to play, or sorry, uh, 13. So mm -hmm. when you play 13 too, you can immediately enjoy the difference in mechanics and the difference in gameplay. And, okay. and it's, they could have been separate games oh, in yeah. separate universes and it would have probably been better in my opinion. It's amazing how different they are between the three. And that's great for some people. I think it worked very well for Ten Two, which is definitely my biggest guilty pleasure of any Final Fantasy game. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I will be very I think curious. Ten Two holds say. up. Ten. I I will fight to the death for Final Fantasy Ten Two. I think that game's great. Costumes, after all, I mean those are. Important. It is. It I is. mean it. It's the costumes, <laughs> and it's basically the Final Fantasy Fifteen, but like it's a girls' trip instead of guys that's driving around. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's a good point. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's it. Oh my gosh, Ten Two is absolutely wonderful. It's so outside of the element of it. That's why I think it got as much criticism as it did. But no, it's still fun. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> So definitely some games. Uh, you're reminding me that I got to play through some of mine because I've got all those games. Cut too. Out. You're cutting out. What? Yeah. A everybody's cutting out a bit for me actually. They're refit for Dizza cut out, but uh, it was I don't understand. Why am I cutting out? Hmm. Just stay right there. <laughs> I blame. I blame Discord. Yeah, that's fair. That it gave is me Discord. On the tonight. Uh, yeah. No. Um, I was gonna say we got one. One more little. Uh, wrap up topic uh this kicks back over to the councils but it's a fun little question if anyone's got it and it's regarding uh the gimmicks of consoles we talked about the wii one earlier um what is a console gimmick current or past that you either really liked or really disliked and i think dizzy g has got one to kick us off with someone's excited mm, very Go. So, giant asterisk, the Dance Dance Revolution gamepad. Mm. Ah, yes. Because Dance Dance Revolution is absolutely amazing, and bringing it to a home console is absolutely brilliant, because so many people are embarrassed about, you know, moving on these steps in a way that is vaguely fashioned, mm -hmm. but definitely not dance. Mm -hmm. The problem is, which pad do you get? you get the $20 one that will last you maybe two weeks and you really can't play anything past a certain level on it because it's not going to be able to keep up with you? Do you get the $80 pad, which makes it very clear that you're a nerd about what's going on, um, is going to be a little bit more solid, but is still going to have problems in a couple of months? Or 
do you full on go and make your own pad? Wait, people did that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that I'm pretty happened. sure I could go to DDR. Still exists. Like that is a website that has existed since like 1998, I think and find a how-to on how to make your own Dance Dance Revolution pad that will actually last through the elements. <laughs> and um, it's it's pretty impressive, and it is a lot closer to the arcade experience, which I still think is always going to be number one. Mm -hmm. But trying to find a good simulation for that that you can put onto a console is awesome. And And... I don't know. There's something about that charm of going through all of those processes and deciding what works and what doesn't work for you that I enjoy. Okay. Da dun. Da dun. Do da. you have one then? This thing is amazing. What is this? Oh my god. I have intentionally bought games that I have on other systems. For on the darn Wii U it is the only way that I deem it acceptable to play Black Ops 2 because every other version is incredibly boring. But when you do it on Wii U, when you have the Wii Mode and Nunchuck, even the real time strategy elements for that one actually work better on it. Just like I've had so much fun with this. So many local multiplayer sessions have worked well because of this thing. Plus, home brewers have really tapped into the potential. Like using the virtual console to have this be part of your DS and your TV be the other part is amazing. You have an HD DS. It's beautiful. It's a thing of wonder. It's, it's, and it's actually got a good feel to it. I mean, they've talked about how the guy who designed this had to go through like over a thousand iterations to finally find something that just, it fits your hands nice. It props itself up well. Everything is actually relatively close. The D-pad does not make absolutely no sense like the switches. And the gamepad itself is actually really responsive, and it even solves one of the Wii's biggest problems. The sensor bar on this is actually more precise than the default one for the Wii. Like, seriously, I have tested it. When you point your Wii mode and just use it for that when you're doing the Wii virtual system, it actually works better. It makes you more precise. It's more refined. So it makes the Wii better. It can play everything from Nintendo preceding the Switch, and just, it's so great for party games. Zombie U. Zombie U is one of the best multiplayer games I've ever experienced. I wish it had more content. So, yes, there are people who can do this with a, a tablet nowadays, or a phone. We need more developers to do that with their games. I will download a, de I mean, Watch Dogs did it. They did it with their, their mobile thing. They had a multiplayer mode. It worked well, so... Yes, please, someone else make something like this, because it's really nice. It's really good. It's so good. Okay. All right. Jack? Uh, you know, I feel like this is kind of a boring answer, but I really liked the uh, gimmick behind Guitar Hero controllers. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. uh -huh. Get out of here! Get out of here with Rock Band. Like I know Rock Band is probably objectively better, but like <laughs> the amount of time I spent on like just Guitar Hero guitars for like the first three games and like some of the spinoffs is just insane, and it felt so good. Like obviously I wasn't playing a real guitar, but like the gameplay just felt really satisfying and good mixed with those music the music choices and everything i there's just been nothing like it to like fill that void in my life ever since it kind of just fell out of popularity um uh honorable runner-up though is definitely the dj hero gimmick yes that time came and went way too fast yeah i think uh some of those rhythm games and of the era were starting to get uh, burnout at that point, which is too bad because they're yeah, that was a good that was a good option. Okay. Darn you, Activision. Uh, so I guess for me, the PS2, and there was a gimmick to it. It wasn't really sold so much as a gimmick as what it supported, but it had a DVD player, and not everyone had DVD players when 
the PS2 came out. And that became the DVD player. So that, 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 that was my thing. I really enjoyed that. It made it really easy. Instead of having multiple things plugged into my TV, it was one thing. And growing up, that was really nice because I didn't have a nice TV in my room at the time. So I didn't have much options. Uh, if we were to do a runner up though, um, I kind of really enjoyed what the DS did for, for handheld games from the Game Boy era. Mm -hmm. um, making it giving you the, the like multi-screen option and it was uh, I really enjoyed that facet of, of portable gaming and truly enjoyed that so that was that was what I enjoyed on the trade-off of that and those are probably those are my option no this is my runner-up oh no, no 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 explain there there's an ass there's a big gigantic asterisk here <laughs> I do not think that the Kinect was the revolution of gaming. I don't think it ever could have been. But the thing is, after playing Rise of Nightmares, it is very clear to me that it could have worked. It's just a simple matter of fact that nobody who apparently figured out how the system worked ever got greenlit for another game. Like, that seriously is it. Every time a game actually figures it out, it never got a sequel. It never got a follow-up. The developers never made another thing. It's the same sort of issue we ha are actually having with VR, where it's like, you can't have all of the experiences on this sort of platform, but there are experiences that you can only have with it. The thing is, at the end of the day, the Kinect is a giant iPhone screen, and there are some amazing games that work precisely in that way that would not work in a traditional context. I will stand by my statement here that this thing would probably be what I would want you to port Dead Space Mobile to. Not a traditional controller, I would want it to be on that sort of control input because it would actually be more ideal for how they set it up. Mm. It's made for essentially two hands and maybe a leg or some gesticulating of your shoulders and hips. There's things that you could do with that and it, <laughs> you, wow, uh, there's my there, there are a lot of things you can do with gesticulation. You are correct. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> there are a lot of things you can do with gesticulation. Uh, um, Oh, wow. Not as much as you can do with a Yeti's tongue. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. But I'm serious. I think the Kinect could have been an amazing thing. And for what it's worth, it hasn't actually died. It evolved into so many different camera systems and all sorts of other things. The technology has outgrown its little humble beginnings, but it could have been a fun, like, optional thing. There were people who, even on the Xbox One, were finding ways to use it for fun stuff. It's just that we didn't give it time. Like, and we were even discussing this before the show. The PS Move, it's a nice thing, but it's not actually better than the Wii. It, the Wii is actually more responsive than this thing. And the fact of the matter is, Sony wasn't, re their hearts weren't really in this. The, the only reason that they are actually pushing it now is because of the VR. Yeah, but, no, um, I, I would agree. That, and if I had to go one further, I think that one of the games I enjoy, enjoyed the most from PlayStation Move was uh, not even- one further completely vanished. My what? You say it again. Okay, what I said is, the the one game I've truly enjoyed uh, uh, with PlayStation Move controllers wasn't even on the PlayStation Move, it was on Raspberry Pi. I think I think that <laughs> truly says something. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It, it just it's it's a shit. And the thing is, like once again, like with the Wii U, Homebrew has found that Connect has tons of features. There was a guy who managed to figure out middleware to use Bluetooth to make it be a PlayStation controller. He was able to get it to res he was able to play Killzone Three with a Connect. It was incredibly slow aiming, but otherwise he was able to properly play it. So like, there was nuance to it. Mm -hmm. There was potential, but it just never got really a shot. So as a result, there's like a handful of really interesting games for it and nothing else. Okay. The always online bit just fucking sucked, though. Why the hell was that a thing? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> All right. Uh, unless anyone has, has anything to contribute. Going once, going twice. Sold. We have made it to the end of the show. But before we go... We're going to talk a little bit about what we got coming up, and then uh, if you're live here on Twitch right now, we'll find uh, a rating, do some thank yous, and uh, and post. 
If you're li you're listening, uh, either thank you for listening on SoundCloud, iTunes, or on YouTube. It's really appreciated that you found us this way and come watch us live sometime. We'd surely appreciate it. That being said, kicking it over to Riverboat Jack, where can we find you and what do you have coming up? Oh, gosh. Uh, you can find me at Riverboat Jack on Twitter. I also host um, We Wanted Adventurers, which you can find on Twitter at We... I should just spell it out. At W E W A A D underscore podcast. Um, it's my my Dungeons and Dragons uh, show that I uh, I host and I DM. And I uh, my more popular podcast is the Best Games Period, where each week my co-host and sometimes some guests uh, discuss one game that may or may not be one of the best games of all time. Um, and uh, you can find both of those on SoundCloud, iTunes. We have uh, Patreon for the Best Games Period, patreon.com slash bestgamesperiod. Um, and you can find all of that stuff and more over on community.extra-life.org. If you don't know what Extra Life is, it's a fantastic charity where people across the United States and Canada come together and play games to raise money for their local hospitals. And 100% of everything you raise goes directly to the hospital to help some sick and injured kids. It's really, really fantastic. Highly recommend you check that out. You can learn more over on extra-life.org. Breathe. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, there we go. Thank you much. Elijah, the unabridged gamer, what do you have coming up? Where can we find you? Uh, you can find me pretty much everywhere at the Underbridge Gamer or just the Underbridge Gamer. It's that for everything. That's me on Twitch. That's me on YouTube. That's me on Twitter, where I'm likely rambling about whatever game I have recently acquired that won't work on Windows Seven. Um, what's coming up is two things. Um, there's going to be more streams coming up. They're going to be spontaneous because life is knocking futz. But um, also, just um, there's going to be some things I'm very excited for on the channel. There's going to be an interview that's long been needing finished up that's going to be going up. And also, two more Spider-Man reviews, because we're doing Clash of the Tie-Ins this year. If you don't know, I'm doing all sorts of licensed tie-ins. And we're going to be doing some pretty crazy ones. And actually, I'm going to make the exclusive announcement of what I'm in planning as the last one that I'll be covering. Because I guarantee you... It is one of the best-selling licensed tie-ins. It is also one of the most critically panned licensed tie-ins. And believe it or not, was essentially a foreshadower to all the LEGO games that would later come about. I found a copy of Shrek 2 in the wild. <laughs> yes. Shrek friggin' 2. Which sold enough to be a platinum hit on original Xbox. Oh no! What? <laughs> what? Compatible? What? Yes. This game sold like gangbusters. The film was so popular that just everybody wanted it. There was this brief time period where Xbox had a ton of exclusive licensed tie-in games, and it actually worked for them a bit. It was how they compensated for the fact that Blanks the Cat didn't do well. But yeah, <laughs> Shrek 2 is terrifying. planning as the last licensed tie-in. Because it is essentially the granddaddy of, oh my gosh, why is this selling well? No one likes it. But um... Yeah, so that's the thing. And also, um, for October, we're going to be having some very special... There's going to be a lot of videos in October. I am actually waiting, the like, in terms of actual weight, putting more content towards October than most of the year because there is a lot of horror games I have been meaning to talk about. It's going to be very exciting. Doom 3 is already confirmed amongst the list. And um, it's all going to culminate in a licensed tie-in that also happens to tie into, believe it or not, two completely original video game franchises in a weird horror multiverse. But we're going to be doing a live stream and a giveaway in October. So it's going to be, it's going to get interesting. It's going to, there's going to be some fun times ahead. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled because all that's coming up. And just, um, yeah, if you want to hear about the greatest games you've never played, on a bridge gamer. All right. Um, so I've got some stuff. Uh, further down the road for for Elijah Dizzy, where can we find you? What do you have coming up on your channel? All right, you can find me pretty much everywhere. Dizzy, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me 
on this wonderful platform here. You can't really find me on Discord that way because you have to put a weird number afterwards, but eh, neither here nor there. Uh, fact is, we are playing a whole bunch of different stuff, uh, mostly RPGs, which is what our, our channel's normally about on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, generically, I think that's going to happen this week as well. We're going to play some Dragon Quest Builders 2, a little bit outside of the realm of our, our general stuff, but I mean, it's still a Square Enix game, and um, they're, they're still role-playing, and I will play lots of silly voices out loud, Yay. which I'm sure you'll enjoy. Um, so there's that going on. I will probably be playing a lot of Final Fantasy XIV offline if it starts getting really, really interesting and gets into the storyline. Maybe we'll do something with that. We'll see. But that's where most of the focus is going to be on. I, I guess it's just going to be a, a Squaresoft kind of month this month. Um, I should theme more of my months that way. Like September, I could do all like school sim games. Like I could play Persona 5 again. And then in December, because I wouldn't have any time left, um, then I can think about other stuff. Well, it would take you longer than September to do Persona, but okay, cool. Oh, that's what I'm saying. So I start in September. By the time I get done, it'll be like this. Christmas. I see. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. It'll be real, you know, it'll be the next new year. You know, you'll be able to be like, okay, we're all. And his audio cut out. That was, that was, <laughs> that was perfect. That was perfect. I was wondering why you're giving me a blank face. Oh, boy. That, that, all right. That, you know, that's very. It was just too foul. Episode. Discord was. Yeah. Discord this was, was like, nope. Yeah. Yeah. Jack's exactly right. Uh, as for myself on here. Discord is. See, that was all this <laughs> started. Clearly, this is a sign, so we're just going to put it out there. For myself, what we got coming up on the channel is we got more coming up with Officer Gene Hart on the Crew RP Grand Theft Auto, Grand Theft Auto roleplay that will be on Tuesday, um, maybe part of Wednesday. We'll see what happens. Uh, I'm switching it up a little bit. We, we're still going to do Elite Dangerous as well, but we're going to try to mix in some Diablo and maybe Warp frame there's some people Ooh. in the community that are talking about that we'll see we'll see um and I'd uh like to help out on this yeah well that's what the subs are saying in the sub exclusive channel in discord so we'll see uh and uh yeah if you if you're watching live you already know where to find me on twitch uh miss michelle Jean on twitch on youtube on twitter at pretty much anywhere um if you're watching or watching on youtube or listening on itunes soundcloud that you can find me on twitch miss michelle Jean, uh, tuesdays wednesdays and fridays and every other sunday here with the noobcast podcast with these fine hosts and that being said for riverboat jack elijah the unabridged gamer and dizzy G, my name is miss michelle Jean. thank you so much for watching and have yourself a fantastic night the hills are alive Bye. The sound of violence.